Scots. We're here with a uh, special guest, John Robertson. How are you all doing tonight? The two of you in the studio with me, how are you doing? I'm well. Doing great. Um, I'm really well as well, actually. I uh, had a good weekend. Been I was looking, lying. Really looking forward to this week. I was uh, lying, I'm, over, I'm hungover, but never mind. <laughs> I, was, I was hungover you yesterday. You wouldn't have known it. Not I something to be, be proud expected. of, though. Being hungover. No, I'm actually feeling fresh today. I think that's the beauty of drinking on a Friday. I've been getting into that kind of habit that's so that I've got like recovery on a Saturday and then Sunday I can actually operate again and do stuff and I feel like I've not just wasted my weekend in like a mire of drink. But you've uh, wasted Saturday though. At my age I need a month. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm starting to feel it as well, you know, it's like two or three days until I feel right. Delayed hangovers as well, they're weird. Never had them before and then suddenly... Boom, if feel alright for a day, if, then Monday. I, I, if you go on a Sunday, it happened to me last week, if you go on a Sunday, you go on um, the Monday feeling, I've actually, I feel okay. I feel pretty good. Next thing, Tuesday, actually, like a train, like both, <laughs> and you're out cold. But um, anyway, we've got John Robertson in tonight. Um, really looking forward to this show. Um, glad to have you on. It was actually really easy to get a hold of you. I yeah. thought we all had this fame, it's kicking off uh, <laughs> online, it was going to be a nightmare, but it was pretty good. Glad to get you a quick reply. It was it's good to well, I mean, I'm not busy on Sundays. Yeah. As well, a rule, yeah. I know, everybody takes a Sunday day off, so... I do, yeah. Well, I've, we had, a lot of, I've <laughs> had a lot of interviews, but none on a Sunday before, so... Hey. No, well, we're, so. The, we're the sort of only really outlet that uses a Sunday night. I think so, this is what kind of makes it a bit unique, the fire squads, like because like people are chilling out, mm-hmm. and then they end up just sticking it on before before work kicks off. I've heard that often. I think maybe it's people. a conspiracy. Maybe they deliberately placed us here and, like, the... The one, the shift that they thought the least amount of people would listen to. It's all right, stick them there, nobody'll be listening anyway. It's all right. <laughs> That's what they thought at the start of it. That's what they thought. Now is Sunday it, nights are the place to be. Is it? Is it an attempt to persuade the population to sleep? You know, you get to sleep <laughs> reasonably early, so up early for work on a Monday. It's a, it's a capitalist plot, clearly. Uh, definitely the show is, on this time, yeah. uh, it's Can't uh, have you tired on a nine o'clock on a Monday morning. We need you operating that machinery. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, uh, I. Um, yeah, so, so. With, um, so John, um, we, were, we were talking earlier. Give, uh, give the, the listeners, because I know there's a good, good amount of listeners tonight. I'm happy to say, um, let them know who you are and, and what you're all about. And, and okay, um, I, I'm someone who was really uh, pretty much unknown, except a few postgraduate students until February of this year, when uh, when I published my research into the BBC and ITV coverage of the the referendum and uh, the the report. The report, which was um, disseminated by Newsnet Scotland initially, but then shared widely across the uh, the internet, the the report upset the BBC in particular. It's quite interesting. It, it accused SDV of bias as well, but SDV didn't bother complaining. They just they took the kind of very relaxed Scottish sort of gallus attitude <laughs> of saying, "Who? Who is he? Who is this man?" And just ignored <laughs> me. Um, but the BBC wrote and complained, and as people know now, I don't want to go on about it a great deal, but. Uh, they complained to my boss, my, my newly appointed principal, and uh, complained to me directly and to him. They missed out several people in the chain and went straight to the top. I had a few, a week or two of anxiety when I didn't know what was going to happen, but uh, my, my employer um, quickly, quite quickly, within a week and a half, so it was long enough for me to stew, mm-hmm. quite quickly um, reassured me of what they call academic freedom, um, but pointed out it wasn't UWS research, it was my research. And from then on, the whole thing's been a bit of a uh, t- the obvious cliche, it's a terrible cliche, a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Um, up till that point, I'd been used to getting the odd letter now and again, odd email from a postgraduate student saying, oh, I've read your research in the journal of whatever, and, uh, and I wanted to ask you a question about it. And suddenly I go from that, <coughs> that level of single figures in a typical month to suddenly 10,000 a day on Usenet Scotland. It's, it's amazing what, what, what's happened now with internet. Um, it's just the, the ability to literally go viral. Like throughout the world now, you've got like nearly hundred thousand views on that video. The one that's the one I actually discovered your work oh. through was that that video. Yeah, well, I mean that that, that, that in itself is astonishing. You know, I, I I've I've joked elsewhere that uh, that's that's pushing a hundred thousand views now for an academic for an academic to get a hundred thousand is is just is just unheard of in in terms of previous forms of media. Mm-hmm. So um, I I often joke that it's only. 99,990 more <laughs> hits than I normally get when I write something. Um, so it, it, you're right, it's a transformation. Uh, it's totally, the, the, totally political, it's the political totally and the media changed. worlds are, are, are transformed. And the Scottish referendum 
has been a, a kind of testbed in some ways for that. I think it's highlighted the huge potential for, for the mass of the population to engage with politics. Mm -hmm. No doubt we'll come back to this in the, in the show, but um, I've, I mean, I'm 64 now and I've, I've never seen anything like it. For briefly, we thought the Arab Spring was going to be a similar thing a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, the forces of the, the state largely reasserted themselves in the Arab world and, and introduced regimes maybe slightly more brutal in some cases, or left uh, dysfunctional states like, like Libya and so on, where nothing much, much is resolved. It may be, some people have argued this, that the Scottish, Scotland is, 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 is an advanced country in some respects. Um, we often joke about our, ourselves as not being very advanced, but, mm -hmm. but it is an advanced country with a long established set of institutions, a legal system, an education system, universities going back to the Middle Ages. So you might argue that this, this transformation in the media and politics will actually embed here because we're ready for it mm -hmm. in a way that some other parts of the world are not. No, that's interesting. We could potentially be ready for it here in Scotland. I mean, for such a small population, so many people are engaged nowadays. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Well, it says 45%. Whether it was that or not, I don't know. But I think it's a large amount of people really totally engaged with it, largely due to social media and being sure. online and getting the media that's not going through all of the filters before it hits your front page. Like, mm. you know? I think regardless of the outcome of the independence referendum, I think what we've seen is a large amount of the population that weren't involved in politics or any sort of engagement in any you know, fundraising or charity work or, or just you know, looking into current affairs. You've tapped into that sort of populace that have been sort of, you know, for want of a better word, asleep to a lot of the you know, things, the situations that are going on in the world. And I think it's a case of right now this new media spring that's happening, this social networking through YouTube, through Facebook, through Twitter. It's a that case needs of to grabbing. become the media. Yeah, you know, that needs to literally go, right, well, this is the media. And it is actually happening over the world at the minute. You know what I mean? Like CNN and Fox News and, and, and kind of portals like that. They're not getting anywhere near as much as like the popular podcast by like Joe Rogan or something. When he's out there talking like kind of straight down the middle, um, his views on things, and it's not really filtered the way it is. And people are starting to wake up. Well, I think w with independence referendum especially, you've seen people that weren't aware of current affairs and, and how the government system worked in this country becoming aware of that and then becoming aware of the fraud and becoming aware that it's, it's you know, maybe not so a long, democracy, it's, it's maybe more mm -hmm. of a plutocracy and, you know, they're not happy with it. They're seeing the different things that's happening, the fracking, it's just, you know, the licences are getting sold from under their houses without even their say on it, you know, the... They're not happy with it, so it's a case of this new media going onto the social social networking and you know spreading that knowledge, that information, and seeing that once you plant a seed, that moves on, and then who knows what will happen? You see, with the advancement of technology, more and more people being connected. Yeah. Like there's still, there's still. A, the, I mean, perhaps it's because I'm older and cynical. Um, there is, a, there is a danger with the new media, however, that they they can become establishment in themselves. And there need to be very, there need to be quite powerful <coughs> checks on that. I think what we, we need to, you know, we've seen Bella Caledonia, uh, Newsnet Scotland, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and Wings moving out into broadcasting. They're already planning big developments there, and they will be a direct challenge. I agree to the, the BBC. You know, the, the viewing figures for 2014 were tiny, mm -hmm. latterly, um, but the problem could be that these, you know, these could be, these can be gradually consolidated in the hands of a, a few people. So there needs to be some mechanism whereby media companies are obliged legally, obliged legally to have democratically elected boards, and those democra democratically elected boards are able to exercise influence. They're not just there to approve the chief executive's wages; they actually do mm -hmm. something. Otherwise, we end up with you know the, the, the same situation again further down the line <coughs> of an undemocratic press and undemocratic. Say, media. say one of the, an alternative media group gets popular to a level, then someday like Rupert Murdoch comes along, and goes there you go. I'm taking that away, just like what he done with Vice. You have seen that? I was about to it's say not, that. Yeah, it's not so much Rupert. Uh, Rupert Murdoch just is like my worry. Just as an example. No, no, but I mean, I, it, it, he is, in a sense, it's not people like him that are my worry. It's the ordinary human beings who f who form these the new media and start to lose their heads a bit. He, it just sort of he, goes he, to he, their heads. What it's the power corrupts thing. Mm -hmm. I think it happens. It happens to just about everybody in those circumstances that power mm -hmm. can corrupt, and therefore knowing that that's in basic human nature. That means you have to put an institutional framework in. So you have to put through law ah, some kind of bar that, that prevents anybody, you know, owning the whole thing. That it has to stay within uh, it has to stay within a wide range of ownership 
and crucially with a board. Mm -hmm. And responsible probably to the Scottish Government's Education and Culture Committee, accountable to it. Mm -hmm. It needs full transparency. Yeah. You know, the way the thing's yeah. set up just now, it just seems with gagging orders and corporate interests and you know, one guy, you know, seven eight percent of the media or whatever figures being thrown by like seven, eight percent of the media being biased towards the Tories and <clears> you know, <throat> when you've got that kind of mainstream control, the corporate control of the press and amount of people that are just, you know, picking up these papers expecting them to be unbiased, you know, this is the news, it's Ebola, it's ISIS, it's immigrants, it's benefit f fraud, it's, 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 it's you need to break that mm -hmm. that sort of control in order to, to change the, the, the knowledge, the, the, the feeling of the country, I think, because what you've seen on the independence referendum, in my opinion, was a win for corporate media. You've seen the power, the spin of, mm -hmm. of, of the Westminster control of the mainstream media and just going into overdrive with the whole fear, the, it was, the what it was ifs. Incredible the, watch. You know, it really was, and obviously we're going to get in more in about that later on in the show. Um, but it was just scary, and, and for me, it's like it just backed up the fact we need to create our own media. If we want to report the news and have the news spread out as unbiased as possible, then it's up to us to do that responsibly. You know, we don't make any profit off of this yet. We're here every week saying things off of a whole variety of websites and news sources that are, you know, we try and filter as unbiased, and that doesn't happen. You just don't see it in the corporate press. I was amazed today, I was one of the people I follow on Twitter is Giles Brandreth. Sometimes comes away with some funny quips and comments, but his comments today were quite good. He said that he's got his full delivery of his Sunday papers, but they aren't Sunday papers now for him. They're basically adverts for Strictly Come Dancing and <laughs> X Factor and all these things. This is that. And uh, his comments still out there on Twitter and they get retweeted several hundred times in the time that I've seen it. And what that tells me, I mean, I don't buy the papers anymore at all. Um, my parents get the Sunday Herald and I read that. The only reason I don't buy it, I tend to think carbon footprint reduction, if you can get it electronically, uh, your same news feed, which I do, so mm -hmm. I don't physically buy the paper. I get it through, frankly, Twitter. I um, also watch RT and various other things on Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain news channels I just won't watch now because I actually don't think it's news. I think it's propaganda. Well, it just seems to have, like, interests... You know, and not the people's interests. Mm. You know, it seems to be focused on, you know, well, what do you think about renewable energy? Well, let's cut to the chief executive of BP and his views on <laughs> renewable energy. It just seems, you know, just mm. most ridiculous <laughs> things. You never really see, like, there's a lot of fear. It's like today there's been 82 violent crimes and three people raped and this murder and this war happened. You don't see people like, well, this happened today in this society and this community got together and done this. You don't really see much of that now. It's kind of like, Fear, 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 buy into this. And a scared population is controllable. That's, yeah. I mean, it serves tremendously well if the population is scared. And we've had this over hundreds of years, attempts to scale a population <coughs> and then make them amenable to more draconian um, legislation. Um, on, a, on a lighter note, you mentioned Ebola, and I've, I've heard that there's about to be a new discriminatory law against the Scots actually asking for, asking for soup because they, we wouldn't be misunderstood if we asked for Ebola soup. Because we don't say of, <laughs> you see. So um, that, that's come. That's, that's an early warning of what's coming from the Home Office. I reckon the we Scots will not be allowed to ask for soup. We have a constitution. <laughs> we've got such a strong constitution, but from whiskey that we could eat Ebola soup. So there you go. <laughs> this, I think you may have taken the tough Scots analogy a bit far. Right? <laughs> Boys like the, us, damn uh, few in the raw deed. It's funny <laughs> you mentioned scare stories. I was reading an article earlier, which we'll send on to you guys, and it was about how there weren't any scare stories about things that happened in the Second World War during 1974 with the IRA bombings. They didn't scare, they didn't want MD to know that mm. this was going on. And what we've now got is a complete reversal of that, where mm -hmm. they keep talking about the threat level being extreme, etc. And they keep talking about COBRA, which is Cabinet Office Boardroom A. And mm. when you actually break it down to what it is, COBRA sounds very threatening and kind of, yeah. you know, high-level guys. <laughs> um, it's not actually true, but... The interesting thing was they were given the distinction that it's a great big long article, I don't know if you've read it, and it's talking about how you know, nobody really wanted to know what was going on with uh, the V2 bombs, etc. The Germans were and all these bombs that they were making during the Second World War. Nowadays, their media is so full of what these people can do in 45 minutes, allegedly, that I think you're quite right, the scare, the fear factor of you know, what we're all about 
makes people think that going in to bomb these countries abroad is actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is that we actually meddled in these countries in the first place and shouldn't have. Well, we, were, we were the first to bomb the Kurds. That's right. In the 1920s, uh, Churchill or, uh, actually authorised the bombing of the Kurds. Um, Bomber Harris, later World War II fame, was in charge. And Churchill said that it was a, it was a, a salutary way of controlling the savages. Yep. That's the background we have in the British Empire. Is that right? Terrible. Well, I'm going to leave you guys to it, but I'm going to be listening to your show. <coughs> because Aye. I've got family duties to perform. I need to go and pick people up. But uh, I'll definitely be listening. A fantastic show, and I'll put a few tweets out as well. Thank you very much. We well, appreciate great. the support great. as of ever. Yeah, Radio Guy that. Glasgow on Twitter. Radio Guy Glasgow. If you want to connect and hear more of his thoughts, uh, some excellent, excellent news articles and stories shared on his Twitter every day. Get involved. Radio Guy Glasgow on Twitter. Um, he's got the show on before us, mm -hmm. 7 till 9 o'clock. 7 till 9. Don't want to miss that one. Ah, great. If you're into well. your uh, rock anyway. Aye, so, aye, so, uh, back to media bias. I mean, just to kind of touch on the Middle East uh, situation now, I mean, it's getting very clear with how open the internet is that we did have a major part to play in what's kicking off there. I mean, mm. especially uh, America, when you consider they've only really been around 300 years yet, they're going into these countries and trying to install their views and values and democracy, when really these places of civilizations have been there for like... Yeah tens of thousands of years, you know, and, and that's that's what's really, when I mean, you look at the IS, it's, it's kicking off whether or not that's really peddled with the media as well, it's like this big, big threat, I don't know, but it seems like we've been in there with a big mixing spoon this is long the mess, before. Yeah. This is the mess that empires create. Empires create trouble when they arrive, when they, when they dominate certain areas of the world, and when they choose one tribe to favour over another and so on. And when the empires arrived in that part of the world, they caused a lot of a lot of unhappiness, cause a lot of violence. But empires also cause trouble when they withdraw, because they destabilise. Yeah. And suddenly you've got a situation where people who have been held down sometimes start to fight over shared resources. And uh, and you might almost argue that, that the only way to deal with that is to wait. Um, it seems like sometimes it seems a passive liberal thing to say, but you do wonder if, if, if we were just to stand back and wait and grit our teeth and go through the, kind of the, the horrors that, that these countries would eventually find a way to stabilise themselves. That's the thing, it's like, how long could you leave? I don't know, people think uh, your conscience would kick in if it was all, and we just weren't going there and weren't doing anything about it, but do you think there is, a, do you think there is an actual need for a, a kind of world police? No, no. You don't think so? No, I don't think so, no. I mean, I think you could argue if the United Nations were, were um, better supported by the great powers. I mean, one of, the, one of the problems, one of the reasons I'm negative about that is because the United Nations, which should enable um, democratically controlled intervention to protect populations is never supported by it's the, 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 the Americans and the British won't support it if it doesn't in, uh, support their interests the Russians and the Chinese won't <coughs> support it if it doesn't serve their interests the problem is, is, is the great powers mm -hmm. the great powers and their self-interest and their desire to control and to project power it's always wanting minerals isn't it it's yeah. like how do we keep well, how do we keep our planet going how do we keep the petrol stations filled we need to continually, for such a small island, I can't get my head around it, like Britain, how did they manage to control, control basically most of the world through the empire? It's, like, it's a fascinating thing. It's it was divide and rule. It was simple divide and rule. They chose one tribe and, and gave them some of the better equipment and then they helped to massacre the other tribes. I mean, it's, it's classic divide and conquer. And it's what the mafia do mm -hmm. today. It's, it's, a, it's a similar exploitation. Um, the, the, the only solution is a very, very long-term one to lead to something like Northern Europe, and that's gradually, over a period of time, more and more democratic accountability. Populations being able to say to their governments, no, mm -hmm. we don't want war. Or governments being obliged to do it democratically. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, that we're swinging more towards democracy as a whole, or do you think it's going the other way? Do you think they're trying to, do you think they're trying to contain us? It seems like that, yeah. that way, do you know what I mean? It seems like it's getting worse where they're... That talk about the Human Rights Act and that getting scrapped. Yeah. When you think um, about like our country in particular, but when you look at like the Middle East, it seems that, that they're on a completely different evolutionary path. Like they are they are on, you know, different laws that are that we would look at as a majority of people in Scotland and think, Well, that's not that's not right on a basic human level yeah, yeah. to do that. But 
over there, the way they've evolved their society, is it wrong for us to say, well, that's wrong, and you know, because we think it's wrong, or is it, is, it, is it at the stage now where ever all countries in the world should should have just universal basic human laws that you know where you can go along the street and do whatever. You know, like when a woman's raped, place. she doesn't need to go to jail because she's not married to a raper. You know, laws like that that yeah. seem absurd to us because of the way that we brought up in our ideology and. You know, coming from personally an atheist background, like I think that you know all, all humans are equal, and yeah. you know more of a compassion level for the but women I rather know, than putting them in jail. But in, yeah. a, in another country like Saudi Arabia, may be different. And you're seeing like, you know, the question would be that we're seeing meddling from the Western world in, in the Middle East. Would IS and the likes of still exist? If, if we hadn't meddled mm -hmm. over there, or is it a product of our meddling that they exist? I, I think it's entirely the latter. Mm -hmm. I think IS are a product of the destabilising of, of, of Iraq and, and the, the restoration of democratic um, opportunities for the, for the Shia, which has disenfranchised the Sunni. Um, I, the, the business of whether or not we should interfere, I mean, I think almost always it's no, we shouldn't interfere. Well, we might have tremendous empathy for, say, the female population there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the situation, I think, is a result of our meddling. These countries, um, under Saddam Hussein and and uh, under the the, the, the secular, secular, militarised, maybe slightly even fascist leadership in in the northern African countries, in Syria and in Iraq, mm -hmm. these were better places for women to live, far better than is the case today. Women right. women became engineers. The Saddam Hussein's top war criminal, uh, yeah, a, a drugs, a, a, a um, chemical warfare expert was a woman. Now you might think that's not, yeah. not tremendously nice development, but um, but these countries you may have argued were already on the pathway. Mm -hmm. They had they had totalitarian leadership, militarized, mm -hmm. like Saddam Hussein. But life for most of the population was far superior to life yeah, now. Of course, and it, you could argue that if they had been left, maybe nurtured democratically, they could have rather than you mm -hmm. can't bomb democracy into them. No. But maybe you could through exchanges over time, and Hussein would have died. Other people would have come through. We might have, gr and we, if we'd supported democratic elements there, rather than rather than charging in and trying, it's like it's like poking a fire essentially. You make well, a fire bigger by poking. But were we charging in with the intentions though, or was there underlying things that we wanted to get a hold yeah, of yeah. that's but actually probably controlled the the whole matter? Well, you say we and, as and well. The word that you say we yeah. wanted to get a hold of. Who is we? Well, when I say is we, it, I say we that is that it in the one percent, like a you know. 25 guys that own this company that are going to profit massively from going to get some deal in the country uh, of course, you know, an you, oil pipeline uh, or of course. get the lithium out the country because all mobile phones in the world covet lithium. And, and everyone needs a new one every you know, year. 100 years ago we never needed lithium in abundance but suddenly every mobile phone in the world has got lithium batteries and where does all the lithium come from? Wait a minute, it's Iraq? Well, how do we get that? Then You know, it's... You, it, fit, you hit the nail on the head with regard to the word we... There's, there's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. And that's the great media problem, is when the media refer to we, who are they referring to? Mm -hmm. And we're often, we're often um, presented with the word we, somehow implying all of us together. Yep. And as you've pointed out there just now, it's really we as the interest of a small elite, of a small corporate elite, who, who benefit from that. And I think, and, and as, you, as you pointed out earlier, um, the, the suggestion that we went in there for humanitarian reasons was, was much projected. But, you, but if you, you might remember at the beginning, it was the weapons of mass destruction thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the rhetoric changes to suit the political needs. And initially it was, it was um, to stop weapons of mass destruction, which would destroy us in 45 minutes. Yeah, it's quite ironic now that we have, after the referendum, we have the 45. <laughs> it's only about 45s, because it was the 1745 rebellion as well. It's only about 40. Um, then, then it switched. Then it switched when it became clear there were no weapons. It switched then to humanitarian so it was a, mm -hmm. a, a big fib in a lot of ways because if it's humanitarian, then surely it would have been humanitarian at the beginning. And from the start, it's like they changed the goalposts just yeah. to suit their needs. As in the referendum. Exactly. You just it's just intense pressure. I don't know how so many. It was like the largest protest ever against uh, going to Iraq. What, a million people in the yeah. UK. For somebody like Tony Blair to still be walking about and like not really hassled much oh. by what's actually went how it went on. I mean, over a million people dead out there because of the result of actually going out there and, and, and even more displaced yeah. and of course and it's like I just the way I think about it is imagine it happened here how would we feel you know if your family get ripped apart all your community get destroyed 
you would have one thing on your mind and that would be anger, anger and you'd be directing that at whoever it was. So that, why do you think, oh, that's hatred is over there for the West and, and while well, our media is saying uh, it's, it was all good, we're in there for humanitarian, there's just a, such a different side to all. It's the, 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 the big myth is that they hate our way of life and they're coming here be, to attack us because they mm-hmm. hate our way of life. But yet, they, when, when asked themselves, going back to Al-Qaeda or perhaps to more recent times, you ask them why they believe that, why, for example, did they support the Twin Towers attack, as many Arabs did support when it happened? They said it's because of the attacks on our people. They saw it as a, a defensive mm-hmm. thing. For sure. I mean, like, if you think about it, uh, I had a conversation with a guy and, and he, was, um, he was discussing about the local uh, town hall in Dumbarton had been flying the Palestine flag. Mm. And and he was saying, no, you know, I don't agree with that. They shouldn't be doing that. He's like, well, well, what? Wait a minute here. What? What don't you agree with? And he's like, well, Hamas, they're they're firing rockets at Israel, and, and you know, it's it's terrible what they're doing. All it's terrorists, basically, just terrorists running. It. It's like, well, have, have you seen like the the type of rockets and stuff that these guys are fashioning? Have you seen what they what materials they actually have access to, in order to try and build a rocket in the first place? I mean, you're like on the list of of materials that are banned is like including paper. We read soap, out all that. It's like pasta like and stuff like crazy banned, items like banned that from they can't, the Gaza Strip. You know, Palestinians literally can't really live their life just now because of these restrictions on them. So the media are painting it in such a way that Hamas are. I mean, I don't doubt that Hamas have terrorists that are working for them that are that are really are doing despicable things. As are both sides will do, um, but the way it's portrayed. You know, I said to him, how would you feel if you were a Palestinian guy or, or you were a Scottish guy and somebody came over here and they bombed your entire street? Your entire street was gone, your family were gone, everybody you ever known, you have grown up with, gone, instantly. You have nothing left, you have no money, you have no food, where do you go and what do you feel? And, you know, what I said, you feel angry, you feel mega hurt and you want retaliation, you want vengeance. Mm-hmm. That's what you're seeing with these guys. I mean, you, you breed, almost breed these terrorists with your, your bombing and, and, and constant, you know, dehumanising them almost. Because these guys are defenceless, they have little money, they have little weapons, little to play with in the first place, and then you're going and rolling in there with your military might. And, and the media have just got the cheek. Well, the B- yeah, the, the BBC completely failed to educate the audience. I mean, yeah, there was, exactly. I mean the, into the, full, the longer story that the people living in Gaza... <laughs> used to live in what was what is now Israel, and were forced into Gaza. Most viewers, uh, Glasgow Media Group, uh, Professor Greg Philo up there, did has been there for several years, studies of of BBC and other coverage of that. And one of the questions they ask of of of, of viewers in their surveys is, who who do you think was there first, and which group of them are the immigrants? And the majority think the Palestinians are the immigrants. Don't realise it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, it's not just it different. Was, it it's was even that long ago. No, 1940s, 50s, yeah. Yep, it's been a power grab since about, what, Second World War times, yep. or post-Second World War, and it's when you look at the map, there's a, f- a few images going about on... The uh, map sure. over time. Yep. Yeah, if you search on the mm-hmm. internet, you, you see from the from the late 40s how small, like how much smaller it's got and how much larger mm-hmm. Israel has got. And when you when you hear the Israel Israel people speaking about, you know, their opinions on it, they, they're going to school, and from primary school upwards, they are taught that... Palestine and Palestinian people are terrorists, they're evil, you know, they literally believe, you know, a lot of their population believe that they are God's chosen people, that is their land, God's chosen land, and, and it's their right, just, they, you know, their human right to take it they, back. They, ba- they base their right on the notion that there's a genetic continuity between them and the ancient Israelites, and there's, there's, a, there's a book I, I, I bought from our university li- for our university library a few years ago, which is about a study that was done of the genetic profiles of Palestinians and Israelis. And it turns out that using elk bones from you know, 2,000 years ago right. of, of the original Israelites, comparing the genetic profile of those bones with contemporary people living there, and it turns out the Palestinians are the Israelites. <laughs> They've changed religion. <laughs> They've changed religion. They became, they became Islamified or Islamicized mm. or whatever. Most of, the people, the most of the people who are now in Israel came from North America. That's Europe, unbelievable, so. isn't it? But it's not accepted. It's a, it's a published book by an, uh, an Israeli academic, but it's it's just it's kind of ignored. I, I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. I would, but just, it's a, I would it's throw a big spanner right in there. 
the, the whole, the whole, the whole, whole thing. It's, it makes the whole thing uh, untenable. <laughs> absurd. Aye, absurd. And, it's, and it is absurd anyway when you see... When you actually look at what the Gaza Strip is, it's like... See, I went on just for interest, and I went on to Google Maps, and I'm like, right, I want to see what the place is like. <clears throat> I went on, and it's like these massive trenches mm. around it, mm-hmm. like, and it's just like barbed wire, these trenches, it's like an totally secluded. It's like, it's pretty much a prison. Mm-hmm. It looks like a prison. You think, you think that, that particular context makes the Scottish one kind of irrelevant? I don't know. Seems I think somehow it's, less dramatic, isn't it? it, it totally. I mean, I'm <laughs> thinking that during the independence referendum, uh, as you can imagine, uh, on the build-up to it, we were heavily covering a lot of the aspects to it, and maybe being a little bit light on other current affairs, uh, world affairs. Um, I mean, you can only take you can only take what's going on in your own shoes. You know what I mean? You can only act upon what's mm-hmm. happening in your country. You know, it's all within the, the, context. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like everybody's um, everybody's got their own problems, and they always seem like the most important problem in the world. Mm-hmm. And I guess the independence referendum was like on a democratic level yeah. was very important. I don't think the bias against the yes campaign was as marked as the bias against Palestinians. I see the really? bias against Palestinians is far more far more sharp. Far yeah. more damaging, and you could argue the consequences are greater as well. I mean, um, why do you think that is? I mean, I, th- I think it, I think it's more deeply embedded, and of course, so it's been it's been an issue for a longer period of time. Scottish independence has been a very quiet thing for most most of my life, really. My my mm-hmm. dad was a was a, was a Scottish nationalist of a slightly less um, less civilized form than the many right. today. Um, <laughs> he may have been anti-English, I think you could have said. <laughs> he was born only 10 miles from the border as well. It yeah. seems quite strange. Maybe that makes Aye. you even more um, patriotic, born 10... He could see England. I was <laughs> grown up, seen it. Yeah. But, it. but growing growing up through my, you know, my time at uh, uni in the 70s and so on, other things seem more important. I mean, the death of trade unionism in Britain, for me, seemed far more significant an event than, than, than independence at the time because I, I still believed in the possibility of a more democratic Britain. At some point, I think, that became apparent to me that that's just not going to happen mm-hmm. and that small democratic countries are better places in every respect. But the, but the troubles in other parts of the world, sometimes you think, well, you know... I, I agree with you, we shouldn't switch off our local circumstances because we can, tr- we can control them. Mm-hmm. There's a limit to what we can do about the, about the Palestinian situation, except, I suppose, to complain to the BBC as much as... Possible. We've seen how much effect complaining to the BBC can have. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you mentioned about the kind of the, the the Palestinian sort of end being really sharp, the media being dead sharp against them, like the the bias. But I mean, here it was done in such a way where it was very acute. And you men- you mentioned this, and it was like if they were they were so sharp with with it here, do you think a lot of people would have believed it the way they did? Like, you know, like people just took in a lot of what was getting said in the record, daily record, and like. Yeah. BBC is, is gospel, you know, but there's probably that acuteness that caught people off guard and, and oh. drew them into that false sense of, oh, this is, this is the truth, I'm actually running scared here, independence is a really, really bad thing. Yeah. Well, I, I think that there's that whole business of media effects is something that interests me, and I, I'm a bit of a sceptic about media effects in general, in that I don't, you know, I don't worry about young people playing violent computer games, I don't worry about people watching violence. I, th- I think nearly all of the population is quite resilient. And I think especially, actually, working people, working class people, are quite cynical about what comes at them from the media. And I think they're quite capable of looking at it and saying, yeah, what's in that for them? Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of resistance to, to media effects. But the one area where there's, there, there, is, there is hard evidence, and it's the one you've alluded to by talking about sca- uh, scare, scare stories there, is that people are frightened, are frightened by negative news about the economy. Anything that, su- anything that suggests that change will damage employment, <coughs> pensions yep. in particular, then I think that, that's a very effective form of negative propaganda. And I mm. think that may well have worked. And, and it, was, it totally did work. I mean, look at the, the like actual, look at the, the percentage of older folk that did vote. It was something like over 70% of them did yeah. vote no. And that was just down to the opening statements of uh, there's a risk to the pension or yeah. whatever. And I mean, people are under the impression that, like, come 19th of September the bank would be empty yeah. you know and it was like I think what you've seen uh, in my, my opinion anyway uh, you've seen the mainstream media planting the seed of doubt the seed of fear the, the pensions the, the jobs the money the, you know the currency issues the, they plant that seed of doubt in a population that are you know a lot of people are, are relatively clueless to a lot of political um, you know 
the situation with a lot of political things in Scotland and, and their extent of research into it goes as far as flicking on to six o'clock news and watching half an hour, what the tube's feeding them and then going away and then, you know, going into the garage, filling up fuel in a car and then seeing the row of the papers there and just having a scan at the front pages and then going into work and having a conversation about with what they're in the front page. And what they're spitting out is what, you know, a very, very, very thin view on, on what is actually going on and it's fed to them by a very few sort of Agendas, really. you know, very few tubes that are controlled by near mm -hmm. enough the same people. That it, it, it seems that we need to break that sort of. That's breaking, of, though. I mean, it shows in Scotland that it's pioneering the breakage. Well, well yeah. the young people, it for really sure. Is. But I think, as you say, the, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said the older population, like maybe the sixty-five plus, that aren't as on, uh, aren't as um, capable on on computers, aren't as in touch with the internet as. Maybe a twenty-one-year-old is maybe you know spending most of life looking mm -hmm. on the internet and looking at different sites, watching videos on YouTube or whatever. Yeah. And I think that definitely you've seen that with independence I mean, like, referendum. Absolutely, so I push it on a bit. I mean, partly for selfish reasons. When you chose sixty-five, you chose very, care, you chose <laughs> no very offense, well there. It was very well. Cause I'm sixty-three, so ah, I'm sorry, on the right then. side of it. But uh, <laughs> I, I think I think it's I think there's a significant population of people on the internet into their sixties and yeah. some of these early seventies. But I think the 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 really elderly population, yeah. you know, people into their eighties and nineties. And there's a huge tragedy in that they were persuaded. And you know, and that they they would lose pensions. That I mean, these people are are, are vulnerable, mm -hmm. and and the media should be more, uh, I think, more considerate of that. You're very right to point out the the business of headlines. Um, mm -hmm. There there is no doubt that a lot of media consumption doesn't go beyond headlines. Mm -hmm. There's research to this effect that that people uh, browse newspapers, read the headlines, may read the opening line or so, and then mm -hmm. think, okay, I've got what it's about, and then mm -hmm. go. So if the headline is negative. It doesn't matter if the, the article's balanced. And this is where this is where I argue with, with, with other people about quality of journalism and quality of broadcasting. They'll say, Oh look, you know, in the third paragraph we said this and then the fourth paragraph we said and we balanced it back and forward. But if the weight in the headlines and that the headlines as well on on broadcasting too, you know, when mm -hmm. Jackie Bird comes on right at the beginning, you know, just a few minutes after the, the, the alleged national headlines and says there's great worry about this and that, then that sticks. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah. instantly. It's the like traditional media needs. is going to stick with the older generation, you know, that traditional sort of six o'clock news, if she's saying that negativity, then yeah. it's going to stick and it's, it's going to echo around the workplaces and people are going to talk, oh, I don't know about that, Alex Salmon's ideas, you know. I know it's subject to a lot of trickery and subject to, to basically being fooled into thinking that what they're watching is an unbiased, unfiltered, this is what's important to you and you should be thinking about for the next couple of days. You know that, and that's what generally, will, what in my opinion, what the what the news represents. You know, it's it's half an hour of here's what you should be worried about, and yeah. here's where your focus should be, rather than this is happening, this is amazing, and what if you do this, and what about this? And it all seems to be in favour of you know energy <sighs> companies, mm -hmm. military action. You know, all about you know we're we're going over here. We're fighting these dangerous people that threaten to come over here and spread viruses and and kill your family and, and it just seems to be fear constantly and, and as you as you pointed out earlier on, fear seems to be the biggest tactic of of controlling you know, the masses, the, the you know, the populace that, that don't really aren't aren't as engaged with, with current affairs as, as maybe other people are and Yeah. It's important you you use the word trickery and I'm not nit nitpicking about words here, but um a, a lot of what the, the, the journalists do is I think is more on it's on a subconscious level. A lot of time because they're so socialised, you know, through their their period at school and in university, mm -hmm. into the Western way of thought, mm -hmm. the idea that free markets are the only way of, of running an economy, the idea that we have this glorious history of our great warriors and so on. Mm -hmm. That these are deep in the mind, and I think that causes them to make choices subconsciously. I, I've I've read a lot of work recently by some uh, uh, psychologists who have done research into the role of the subconscious. And they found that when people talk about the decisions they made, this is that anybody talk about having made a decision, if they actually monitor their brains, their brains as they're making these decisions, they see movement, they see activity before they think they've made the decision, and they think that humans have evolved in a lot of situations to make decisions unconsciously or subconsciously, and then rationalise it after the event. And so that means that people in in the media are making decisions based on their lifelong experience which predisposes them to the establishment. 
and not to question it. And then afterwards we'll claim that they're being fair because they mm. don't know that we're being biased. Sometimes. So it's almost like your life experiences and what you've, you know, what you've observed and what you have encountered gives you some sort of confirmation bias. Yeah, yeah. a predisposition, I think, is a predisposition. And I think, I think one of the challenges, I think, for all human beings in, in, you know, is, is, to, is, is to educate yourself beyond that which you, you inherited from your family, from your, your school and so on. I, mean, yeah. I, I did history at school and I heard how wonderful the British Empire was. Nothing but the wonders of the British Empire. How wonderful Columbus was. Yeah, well, exactly. And then, then, I, then I started to read stuff later when I was at uni, and I realised the British Empire was, wasn't just different from what I thought. It was the exact opposite. <laughs> it was a massive protection Wait racket. a minute. <laughs> and I, I've, I've, often, I've often said to colleagues that, you know, who, who, who say when I've, I've been in Russia today that, you know, that, you know the, the, they talk about the horrors of, of Russia and, and of the Soviet Union before. And, and I say that in, in, you know, in 50 years' time in a, in a university somewhere else, I don't know where, some other developed country, um, then they'll have, a, they'll have a history project for the first year. And the task will be compare the British Empire with the Soviet Union. And the outcome, to my mind, well, the Soviet Union will look quite good. <laughs> Despite all the horrors of the Soviet Union, it was well-intentioned. Women were educated, could, become, could get great jobs. Standard of living went up. There was a horribly oppressive secret police. Mm -hmm. But they weren't mm -hmm. massacring their population, nor were they sending them in huge numbers until the Afghan war. They were largely defensive. So that, yeah. <laughs> Gone off for a wee bit of a tangent there, but never mind. No, definitely. And, and like, I'd actually heard, um, I think it was Graham Hancock, talk about um, he'd done some work in uh, looking at Nazi Germany and uh, comparing it to uh, like America nowadays and basically the techniques that they use in, in, in their and their media with propaganda and you know how they how they actually actually act military wise and what they were doing and their strategies and they were so similar as to what Nazi Germany were doing. It, it even seems like when, when you start <laughs> treading that line it feels like you shouldn't but that's again that's just been drilled into me. Yeah. Uh -huh. no, it's and kind it of strange seems like feeling crazy like, that whoa. I'm thinking of what the, you know the leader uh, of the the free world the great eagle is is what similar to that Prize recipient so sweet, you know and it's yeah. but I guess again that's the whole media spin and what you've been brought up with and that constant being drip fed the 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 image of what the British establishment think what your world view should be and what they want you to be and not questioning and, and you know, thinking we're this great yeah. empire. You know, rule Britannia. The, the link, the link between Nazi, Nazi um, propaganda and uh, North American. It's quite interesting. People make comparisons looking back to Nazi Germany today, mm -hmm. and they find elements of what's happening in the U.S. as as evidence of a drift towards fascism. But mm -hmm. there's not. There's also another pathway which is quite interesting. That's that the the man who most influenced Goebbels, the propaganda minister of mm -hmm. Nazi Germany. I've, I'm afraid I've forgotten his name, as you would expect, in front of a microphone. <laughs> but he was he was he was an American. A corporate marketing guy, who 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 was also a direct descendant of, of Freud, Sigmund right. Freud's nephew, grandson, or something, who picked up a lot of the ideas Freud had about the unconscious mind, and right. how you could reflect it. He went to he he ended up in North America working in in marketing, and and in propaganda because the word propaganda wasn't a bad word, in America in the 1920s and 30s. People thought it was a, a nice new scientific technique. And it would be quite useful for corporations to develop propaganda. They didn't look down their noses at it. And Goebbels knew about this guy. And he, so right. he took his ideas directly from American corporations. So he's like, I can twist this, I can use this to so our advantage. Yeah, it's a useful theory, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably what you're seeing nowadays, well, not probably, in my, my opinion, what you're seeing is, is just the exact same propaganda being being. Much improved. Out. Yeah, like much, much improved, much more subtle, as, as you were pointing out. The, that's the a scary, beginning. scary thing learned about it, how subtle it is. And, and yeah. learned how, uh, how the population reacts to certain propaganda yeah. methods. So. They don't even have to learn. In some ways, as I said earlier, it's kind of internalised. It's become subconscious. The, 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 the people in the, in the in elites um, go to the same schools, same universities. You know, 50-odd 50, 50 percent of the top 100 journalists in Britain went to Oxford or Cambridge only. Oxford or Cambridge. They all go to private schools. They mix. They don't have to conspire. They just know what they should do because they, mm -hmm. they act in their own interests, and their own interests are the interests of the class they're part of. And so the, the media editor went to school, socially mixes, sends his children to the same schools as mm -hmm. as, as the, the executive in a corporation or the general. And they all look the, out for each other, all buddies. They, but they don't have to actually. They don't. Well, I mean, it's, it's easy to go into, to go into that kind of language or to look out for itself. Mm -hmm. they, they don't even have to. 
They just look after themselves. <laughs> Interesting. It's because, a, it's a, it's you know, a, they don't mix with anybody else. They're not. They are in not that much. bubble of of sons and daughters of executives of of elitists. So naturally, yeah. they're all going to be brought up with the interests of right, making money and being successful. Sure. And it just seems normal to them mm-hmm. because Aye. they don't have the, the the perspective that say working people would have. They don't have the reference point at all. No. Their reference point is just of of living in, in that kind of. Making their own bread, never buying a loaf, for example. <laughs> <laughs> bread I like maker. that. Yes. I, I like that. That was a right. Miller band, wasn't it? Uh, Miller I, I think it was Cameron, was it not? Miller wouldn't. Oh, I thought it was Miller Didn't know the price. I, of I, I thought it was Cameron. It might I be Miller No, it was Cameron. Was it Cameron? Was certainly asked as well. I remember the one when he was asked, right. and he said, "Well, I do. We don't buy uh, loaves of bread." It, it, would have been, it sums it up. It would have been funnier if it had been Miller And again, you two guys are much younger. Do you remember the kind of bread called Melinda? Demanda Milibanda, it would be instead of Demanda <laughs> Melanda. Do you remember Demanda Melanda? I actually don't. No. no. You might well, care if you're a lot older. There was an advert which was Demanda Melanda, so it could be Demanda Milibanda. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it would only work for the older viewers. I, our older <laughs> listeners can, uh, can yeah. hopefully relate to that. Remember, if you're listening, please get in contact. Uh, you can get in contact with us via text and 07538 984 984. We want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear your questions. Please do. Get in touch. Professor John Robertson. It's, it's just John for nice people. <laughs> just, just, John. John. just John. If there are any bumptious people listening, it's Professor. Yeah. <laughs> well. Bumptious up themselves, then they bumptious, must call I me like Professor. That. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that word. I've not heard no, that I that bumptious. Can I add that to the vocabulary? I'm stealing that one. Ca- Captain Mannering in... Uh, in, in the what was it called the kind of the television series Captain Mannering a little kind of bumptious guy bumptious yeah never mind you can guess you can, you can tell by it, the sound of the word it's taking it uh, I'm, I'm taking the, taking that word definitely now uh, 07538984984 is the word that, uh, the number again sorry get in touch texts don't cost you a thing if you've got free messages it's not going to charge you so get in touch also on the Facebook Fiery Scots um, I'm going to stick a wee track on get another get another tea in I advise you all do the same we're in with John Robertson from the University of the West of Scotland talking about all things media world affairs <laughs> and we're back on the Fiery Scots I uh, hope you're all doing uh, well tonight uh, a couple of tracks there Massive Attack we're just complimenting Massive Attack there beautiful can you say about Massive Attack Fantastic, Perfect great driving music as you, were, as you were mentioning. Yeah, in the dark. Yeah, in the mm-hmm. dark with the street lights flicking by. <laughs> and finished symphony, great. Well, obviously, track. having your headlights on at this time, you know. Well, not, I, yeah, that would. Yeah. <laughs> Probably <laughs> recommend it. Completely in the dark, but uh, we are back live with Professor John Robertson, who is an independent researcher amongst other things, amongst his role at the University of the West of Scotland, as the the genius there. <laughs> <laughs> if there are any of my colleagues listening at that point, that's when they fall off the chair. <laughs> because, uh, pre- I, 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 you know the stereotype, of course, of professors is they know a lot about something, but are completely incompetent in every other aspect of life. <laughs> unable to climb stairs, that's, that sort of thing. Unable to order coffee without spilling it. <laughs> and so um, I doubt they're listening, but if, if, if Leslie Ann or Marie are listening, they'll be, you'll be laughing right now. Seems Good. unlikely. But they're Good in, they're day. in. They're in the air, so they won't pick it up too well, I don't think. But um, uh, you can get it from the, the TuneIn Radio app. They could. Or uh, uh, pulseonair.co.uk. There's a listen live link in there as well for everyone uh, to share that. Uh, right, uh, who else is listening? There's a guy, Lewis Henderson, he's getting in touch. He's like, to Prof uh, Robertson, ask if he thinks ground troops will be drafted into Syria soon and what impact this will have on the mainstream politics. Um, he's enjoying the show uh, from Lou. Uh, so... Yeah, that's well. That's that's quite a hard question because it's about the future, and <laughs> you should never predict the future. Of course, um, I think there's tremendous resistance on the part of the the, the Western powers to to send in ground troops, and it looks as if the Kurds are making a bit of a, a fight back. So I think that might have delayed it. I think if there had been a massacre in that Syrian town on the border, whose name I've forgotten, um, I think if there had been a massacre there, I think that might have pushed things over. Into into the ground troops being deployed. I think UK ground troops way down the line. I think um, I think much more likely they'll persuade some of the the Arab countries <coughs> to put some ground troops in. Um, what, what's happening there is is a horror. You know, it's not beyond belief because we've seen it before. Um, it's a, it's a classic example. I think uh, in the media coverage of a tremendous simplification of the whole thing. But the major failure, I think, is our. It was our decision to go in there in 2003 
and pull apart a country that was unpleasant to live in for some people, but was far more pleasant than what we have today. Absolutely, and see, um, I had an interesting conversation uh, with someone who was saying, if Saddam was still there, do you think like the, the IS would have even sprouted up at all? Do you think he would even, he, or he would have just completely, the idea might not even have been born if no, I th- out there, if he was still as established as yeah. he was before we waded in? He had tremendous control, he had tremendous, he had a huge army, which uh, melted away um, in the face of, of Western troops, but that was because they had, it wasn't because they were they had no use as soldiers. They were they had no loyalty to, to him, and uh, naturally weren't going to lose their lives for him. But they were they were very effective in controlling the different uh, uh, areas, the different ethnicities, and different 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 religions in uh, in Iraq. Not in a, a, a way we could any of us could approve of. I mean, pretty pretty horrific. But when you compare one with the other, then then it was less horrific than what's happening right now. Uh, it was something that had evolved there over hundreds of years, and and if we'd maybe kept out of it. If we'd kept out of it, instead of interfering, then maybe Hussein would be gone by now anyway. Might be replaced by one of his sons, then one of his sons might have been assassinated by someone else. And You know, we, we could be moving. The country was already moving to a better quality of life for most of its citizens. Iraq, before the sanctions, was the wealthiest of, of Arab countries, and women had the best of lives there. <coughs> women could walk unprotected in the street, women could apply mm-hmm. to university, women became engineers. Um, there's There's little doubt that we... We messed up something that was that was progressing, in favour of something that's almost medieval in its in its horrors. Because people will argue that the countries in the Middle East are like so far behind Western uh, society, like we need to intervene or they'll just all kill each other. It's like you, know, so you get that argument where we've evolved to a point where we are okay to each other, where we know, what, we understand what democracy means. And but like I've heard people arguing with me saying that. Every, the countries in the Middle East are just barbaric and it's just the way they are and if we didn't have Americans going in and world policing the place it would be a lot worse, it would be a lot kind of but I think that's just driven by, by the media again? Or? It's, driven, it's driven also by uh, by something called Orientalism one of my, one, one of my you probably know uh, from earlier uh, statements I've made that one of my few heroes is Noam Chomsky the, the, the mm-hmm. originator of the propaganda model and his explanation mm-hmm. of western media bias the other significant thinker for me is dead now, unfortunately, is Edward Said, who was a Palestinian. And he said that even liberals in the West can't see the Arab without allowing their biases to come into play and to think of the Arab as sneaky, anti-Western, violent, violent towards his women and so on. And, and much of that is, is, is based on the, the impression we have of a few extremist groups like, like IS. What, what the, the theory you described there doesn't explain is, is that in the past... The Arab world has been more sophisticated than the Western world. In Europe, until 19, 1945, <coughs> was easily the most dangerous continent to live on, easily, easily the most violent. We had, you know, we had great art, we had great philosophy, and so on. Mm-hmm. But we had we had leaders prepared to Politically, launch it was industrial a, it was warfare. A nightmare. I mean, like yeah. not far from here, look at Clay Bank, yep, and that's like Clay ten Bank. minutes from our house, hmm. and you had two hundred and something bombers over the top. Dropping phosphorus on you and on uh, civilians. On on civilians, yeah. the tenements. My gran lived through it. I sit and get stories from her yeah. all the time, and it's like, it's it's totally fascinating to think that that actually happened. It was not that long ago. I've got family members directly who were there, lying in a field while there's bombs going off fifty to a hundred meters. Yeah. Yes, I, the, the industrialization wow. of war and, and the massive civilian casualties from the from the bombing of Guernica and the Spanish Civil War through the you know, the carpet bombing of World War Two and the bombing of Vietnam and so on, and the recent bombing of, of, of Iraq and, and Libya and, and Tunisia. The, the, these suggest to me that, that the opposite of progress, that if you, if you go back a few hundred years, civilian populations were largely safe. There was the occasional massacre when a city resisted an army, but mostly armed combatants were the victims. By the time you come to the end of the 20th century, armed combatants are quite safe, relatively speaking. There was a study of young Americans in, in Iraq, young black Americans from Washington, and they discovered they were safer in Iraq than they were in Washington. They were more likely to be killed in Washington than they were in Iraq. No it's the way. ordinary people we suffer, always. That's crazy. It was, you know, that's just that stat there. That, you know, that just kind of puts it all into a, a more significant place in my mind that how stupid it is that what we're doing over there. And, and there's another stat where like, you're more likely to be run over 
then actually kill by a terrorist if you're an American as well. There's like things like that that come out as well. More likely to get hit by justify. lightning or be killed by a terrorist on home soil. And oh, it's a bit, but you see the mainstream media portray it in a completely different light that, you know, terror levels are extremely high just now because ISIS are, if you are believe this, you know, the sun and the record are are going to invade this winter on the back of huge spiders that have been breeding in your garden, mm-hmm. filled with Ebola. We had, we had to be very careful this year with our, our, our when our first year students arrived because our IT support department had changed their, their acronym to IS. So we had to point out to the students <laughs> not to be worried of IS. They're quite much nicer than that. <laughs> They'll help you with your access to oh. the internet. <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> IS. No, that's great. Um, and just like while we're on the subject, uh, you mentioned Noam Chomsky being one of your, you know, you know, idols, and he's, yeah. he's one of mine as well. And we've referenced him quite a lot in the show. And just uh, on the on the topic of war and, and military, one of the things that he said that stuck in my head was says that the media portray the question of um, do you support our troops as a diversion away from do you support our policy. Yeah. Because that is the question that you really not want it. Yeah. You know, you're not allowed to ask, but no. the one that you should be asking is: yeah. Do you support our foreign policy? Not do you support our troops? Sure. Because of and course you support the troops. It's your it's your pal's yeah, son it's or your, yeah. you know. And of course, yeah. at a human level, you want to see them okay because you yeah. grew up with them and your pals are with them or your cousin knows them. And yeah. but I mean, what you should be able to throw at them is the, is the question: Do you support our troops to stay at home? And train and be ready to defend us, should we ever be attacked. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I, most of us are not complete pacifists. If we were attacked, and our villages and our towns were attacked, we would want our soldiers. Mm-hmm. And boy, would we we support them then. But mm-hmm. the idea that we should support their wasteful uh, the use, their use, and you know, being allowed to be killed for no particular purpose, then why should we? The whole point of having soldiers, having a defence is for for the defence and soldiers to be in that country. You know, like fast lane. It's got this huge base up there, very little amount of troops or marines or whoever up there, and it's just storing these nuclear weapons, you know? And like a lot of British troops and American troops are all out in the Middle East carrying out operations and <clears throat> probably find the the force in America's depleted quite a lot with the, with the amount of operations they've got on the go throughout the world, like the actual amount of army personnel in America. You know what I mean? They still they still have a military presence and I think I'm right in saying three quarters of the countries on the planet. I think they've got a military presence in about 145 countries and they've got significant bases. They're nearly a thousand nearly a thousand bases worldwide, I think I read. Is that? Yeah. And that is in, in places you would never think. And like, on the radio, I mean, you pick things up all the time. On, uh, listen, in the car, there was an, um, a piece that came on and it was about how Obama was going out to Poland to meet the Prime Minister out there and that came on and the Prime Minister like, I'm very happy to have Obama over here. He's, like, he's installing two mil- new military bases and personnel. And we're really happy for this to be happening. And I'm just like, this is on the news. And it's scratching my head. Think, why is that happening? Why is that like, surrounding Russia or what? Like, what's the actual script? And why is the Polish Prime Minister so happy? It's an that? attempt to pressurise the Russians, isn't it? I suppose. It seems that way. It seems it's a buffer like state to you know Europe and, and Russia. Poland seems to be like a buffer state where, you know, There'll be a pull, a, a war between the West and Russia, and that's what it seems to be with Ukraine as well. Obviously, mm. you're the expert in this, so you can shed some more light on it. But um, <laughs> that's right. Set me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what it seems to come across in that you know you're seeing America dabbling, and you know, it seems to be every country's affairs and and doing it with a you know black ops, the psyops, the propaganda through the media, the and you know. You don't know who to trust you now. You don't know who's telling the truth. Yeah, that's why. That's why. You, I, mean, I think the, we all need to kind of read widely and watch widely. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking before the the show about, um, about Russia Today, who've interviewed me, and um, and uh, I've had one or two people say to me critically that I, I shouldn't associate myself with with you know by implication Putin and his policies in places like uh, like. Uh, what, where is uh, Ukraine? Like the Ukraine, mm-hmm. and uh, and, I, and I agree with the criticism of that. But but I think the, we have to take the same view with the BBC that when the, when the BBC report on something that is to do with the interests of of British elites, with yep. the British establishment, we can't trust them either. And I think when we watch Russia <coughs> today, we need, just need to be alert to that. That when Russia today talk about the Crimea and Ukraine, 
Can't trust them. That's exactly that's it. Can't trust them. But Nailing when they talk the about something else, when they talk about Africa or somewhere else, it's often very good quality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that. Same. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. No, for sure. I mean, and, and there's specific shows that air on RT as well, and um, one in particular, Breaking the Set, with a, um, a journalist, Abby Martin, and when she speaks, she says she has complete editorial freedom. It's her thoughts, mm. and and that's important. And I, I believe I that. I don't <clears throat> think you see that kind of thing I believe on, that, on that the BBC and on STV. I don't think you see it certainly in in such a prime position as what it is on RT. And while while she see like the the mainline journalism, like they're just a standard news that's on repeat throughout the day, every twenty minutes, half an hour, is like pro Kremlin. It's funded by the Kremlin. So it's going to be pro-Russia, it's going to be this is what our political view in the world is. But, as John pointed out, it seems to be like when they do a story on somewhere else in the world, or you know, like Africa or whatever, they seem to really have you know good content, and you don't seem to get that over here at all. They expose a lot of kind of corruption. You yep. don't get that in the BBC. Yeah. You know, there's like stories like that Chiquita Banana Company. Aye, that was, was like how they were involved. Like, um, you get Chiquita Bananas and Asda and... But it was fascinating listening to uh, Abby Martin when she nearly got uh, she got sent she nearly got sent to the Crimea off of the main bosses of RT because when she spoke out against Putin she spoke out she spoke out against what Russia were actually doing and operating in Ukraine and said I don't like what the mainline coverage of RT is mm-hmm. and you might find this weird as a viewer as me saying this because I'm on RT but I have complete editorial freedom of my show and I feel it's my human right to say this and I need to say this mm-hmm. and RT has been biased. She was threatened with going to the Crimea. And what interestingly, what she said in the podcast I was listening to was, you know, she threatened them and said, look, if you guys want to be taken seriously by the world, then you need to show both sides of the argument. Because if you just feed that one side of the political spectrum, this pro-Russia spectrum, people are going to switch off and you're going to lose that international appeal. Mm -hmm. You need to keep, you know, feeding like other information and have the flip side, even if you guys don't agree with it. You need to show that. You need to give it some airtime. And she kind of got away with it and kept her job and, and is carrying on to this day. But I thought it was really interesting as, you know, for any news source, they, they need to mm-hmm. be taken responsibly and seriously. They need to present both sides. And, and obviously a lot of your work has is, is went into how the media wasn't presenting both sides equally in their independence referendum. And, you know, I, I think that's a constant battle just now. We're not seeing it. We're not seeing a balanced, independent, you know, fair press and but, it, but we, we've got the possibility of, of constructing one for ourselves mm-hmm. by I mean, we, we've spoken earlier about the emergence of new media in Scotland and of course mm-hmm. that that'll be part of that but I think if 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 people are exposed to ideas in, in a proper secondary education and in a proper university education where they're exposed to ideas <coughs> and conflicting ideas then I think that provides people with and you two obviously got these tools the ability to go looking for stuff and the internet obviously massively f- 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 enables that that we can we can we can we can look intelligently and there's always been a, a rather kind of a snobby sort of attitude towards audiences thinking audiences are dupes and my experience of i mean i grew up in a working class community and i worked in industry for a while my my experience was there were a lot of people there who were perfectly capable perfectly, perfectly capable of seeing through and although they read sometimes the sun and so on it didn't mean they embraced the ideas mm-hmm. of the sun, they often laughed at it. They read mm-hmm. the sun for a laugh mm-hmm. a great deal of the time. Mm-hmm. And so I, th- I think we you know, the, we can probably, well, under capitalism, we probably can't do anything about a biased media in an ultimate sense, but we can continue a struggle against biased media, <coughs> uh, enabled by, the, by social media a great deal, but also by the emergence of new media, and in particular by education. If, if, if there was a I mean, people laugh at media studies. Is a very the the the, the 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 sneering at media studies mm-hmm. is of course because media studies is the most dangerous of subjects because mm-hmm. like sociology in the seventies and eighties and so on, media studies lifts the carpet and looks mm-hmm. underneath, and and although it's about media, it's about capitalism as well, and so if you do media studies properly, you create a generation of people who can critique. So I'm sorry, to use a posh word there, but can crit- critique the media, look at the media, and say, why are they saying that? Let's follow the money. Mm-hmm. Let's see where that goes back to. I think that's, I mean, this, this is an old agenda for me. That there was an attempt to introduce media studies in Scottish schools, and it is there in one or two schools, but it's a low-status subject. Mm-hmm. Kids, the, 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 the less able kids are pushed towards it if, they're, if they get a chance at all. And, and I think what, what's most important there is that the reason for media studies being low-status is because it's the most dangerous. 
it has they to don't want an informed population. It's too dangerous. It's, no. it's you would, as you say, you're lifting up the carpet to, to stuff that would, that would, once that seed's planted and once you know about that, you can't ignore it. And and it's your your world view changes. You're inevitably going to hit that point where you go, well, wait a minute. Every, well, most people yeah. I'd like to think who enter a media course at uni would go right. Wait a minute, you're always you're going to hit that and at some that stage, starts, and that's probably a worry to them that sure. the amount of well, the volume of people hitting that. Well, yeah. well, wait a minute here. We need to go mm-hmm. further in. This is incredible. And once that question and attitude is sparked in one thing, it mm-hmm. snowballs into mm-hmm. others, and then they start questioning other things. And they go, well, if they can lie about that, then what else are they lying about? Have they lied in the past? And that's not a have good thing for them you? at all. And it's not because it really does, you know lift up the carpet on, on all the dirty laundry that's been swept under the rug by the by the powers that be, the mainstream media and what's been what's been fed to you. Yeah. At and the heart of all of this is the corpora- are the corporations. Yeah. Far, far far more than our political leaders, because they're quite insignificant figures in, in world politics. It's the corporations. And the problem is though you've got like the cabinet and it twenty twenty two out of twenty nine cabinet members are millionaires mm. and a lot of them like mm. the environment Minister who's got ties with like, fracking companies and George Osborne's sure. father in law has a fracking company, and you've all of a sudden got George Osborne and that sending through laws through the House of Commons and House of Lords, removing removing the right for you to object to them to frack underneath your house, and nobody knows about it. And the whole cabinet's just been run by the, the puppets of the corporations, and it's it feels dangerous to say that, but at the end of the day, it's a reality, and it looks like, especially in Scotland, that most people are waking up to that, and that's yeah. it can only be a good thing for the masses, anyway. Um, and with the, the likes of the vow and all that totally collapsing, which we kind of knew was going to happen anyway. Well, we had a good feeling that we were going well, on the previous. It was more than that. I, I didn't be, believe a thing. Um, I, I thought it was like ridiculous, scandalous that the Daily Record ran with that. <clears throat> ancient looking scroll type thing with the three faces and the three signatures again it's propaganda Pro- and it totally worked because I, I admit I was duped I walked into the yeah. shop in the morning for a row and I looked and I'm like wow look I at that. that that might mean it's a bit of safety if we don't get it anyway so it was like maybe if we, uh-huh. if we get a no vote it might be okay we'll still get some powers I was duped it took me 10 minutes and I thought no <laughs> that can't be <laughs> what do you think there's there's a, a big movement on, on Facebook um, to punish the day of the record you know, oh, telling, people, telling people don't buy it and uh, ironically um, Newsnet Scotland featured an article by somebody, I think named maybe Moody who made a case for forgiving the daily record, his view was that the, the, the journalists there you know, just have to do what they have to do and it's not their fault and, and so on, mm. and, and I mean I, I'm not very sympathetic towards that um, I, I, I personally take the view that you know, the daily record is not sacred and no. if the daily record were to collapse then those journalists would find jobs elsewhere Maybe in the new media. Just like if nuclear was removed from fast lane, the trained personnel would find jobs elsewhere. Yeah. I've, never, I've never heard the daily record compared to Trident, but that's well, quite it's, it's that way. It's, it's interesting. It's comparison. transferable skills at the yeah. end of the day. I know your point's well made. Um, definitely. Now we've got a couple of texts in. Uh, George from Newsnet Scotland. He's saying a good show, guys. Interesting discussion on the media. Say hello to the professor for me. Well, I just did there. Yeah. Um, George Alexander, who's. Yeah. I had an email exchange with George recently. Oh, excellent, excellent. Thanks for texting. About that um, very same issue I mentioned there, the, the article by Moody, which um, seemed just to be. Just when you said that, I remember the, the text. Mark with synchronicity there, that yeah, should pop up. But uh, George and I disagree, I think, maybe a bit, because he seemed a bit more forgiving, but uh, <laughs> maybe I'm Old Testament on this. <laughs> uh, he's just saying an inter- interesting interview today on Radio Scotland. Um, let's see. Where former Lib Dem leader Menzies Campbell listed BBC presenter James Naughty as a regular dinner guest. <laughs> <laughs> no- Naughty, by the way. Never mind. There you go, Naughty. Uh, he's just uh, a Naughty boy. So the texts are flying in. Um, oh, always happens with this phone. You get a, a load of texts and it comes up SMS, memory full. The phone is, uh, I think it's from 1948. <laughs> <laughs> it is that, and it uh, charge it up in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen Fastlane. Fastlane is one five nine army and five twenty civilians. That's it. I'm guessing that's from a potentially lost. Um, if we got independence, but most are, are civilians. I think so. Who could be redeployed to non well, nuclear? Of course, I, I think the danger with these things, with the propaganda, is that the media spin is that people that that do these jobs. Don't ever think, well, I'm smart enough to do this job, so I'm smart enough to apply that same sort of transferable skills to any job. 
Mm. It's just up to me to be industrious and you know, and open my eyes up to that. And I think if you look at the the wide spectrum of jobs and activities that human beings are capable of doing and do across the world, I think if people lost their jobs, they'd be more than capable of applying those skills elsewhere. Mm. I think what you've seen with the, you know, you touched on Faz Lane. People, people don't want it immediately. People don't want to lose their car. You don't, you know. And that's, that was the risk that was put in their hands, things like that. This is that, and they're scared. It's, it's fear. And they put that fear in and they think, can I be bothered with three months unemployed? Mm. And they don't ever spend any time to look into it or whatever, or they might not. And, and that's, they're subject to the trickery of that because it plants that seed of doubt and they think, oh, wait a minute, I was money. Quite su- yeah, I was quite surprised during the, 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 the debate about that, about um, military def- Ministry of Defence jobs mm-hmm. in, in Fuzz Lane and in Recife and so on. I was surprised the, the, the SNP didn't just, or the Scottish Government, didn't just guarantee them employment. Because it's, it's a quite a small number of people. It's only a few thousand people. Because uh, we, we have quite a small proportion of the budget comes here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's quite a small number of people employed in, by the Ministry of Defence in Scotland. I, I, I wonder why the SNP didn't just say, oh, th- we guarantee you employment. That, I, they could have done it under the banner of the Scottish Defence Force. Yeah. They could have, I mean, that was a big thing. That was going to be the headquarters at Fast. No doubt the Better Together would have said that was dirty tricks doing that, but then they played dirty tricks in the last few days quite uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, you could go on about the dirty tricks in the last few days I mean they were <laughs> incredible but I mean see when you look at the job losses through the UK government both on the Clyde yeah. Yeah. and through Faz Lane you had like some, uh, something like 10,000 near enough working in the 90s in Faz Lane and now it's down to maybe 5,000, there's, there's a huge drop in the amount of people working there look at the drop on shipbuilding on the Clyde I mean, they've been reduced to basically two shipyards, three, mm-hmm. including Ferguson's. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any more, but I mean, com- compared to what that was, and compared to where we could potentially be, we had a country like maybe Norway, or we had a country like Norway, uh, Norway and they built 100 boats for their defence of their waters mm-hmm. and of their oil rigs. And that's 100 boats that are built in Norway. Mm-hmm. If Scotland were an independent country, we could have a hundred boats of our own out actually defending the waters, and not. Uh, we would get the contracts for building our uh, own. Of course, boats. and you could have you could have, you could have a busier clay with twenty, thirty thousand more yeah. jobs, not the risk of some five hundred uh, allowing people to to to, to adjust their This is their where the, the, our media failed us particularly badly. Mm-hmm. Was that was the risks of the union, mm-hmm. the risks that we have incurred of course. staying in the union for so long. And the risks of continuing of that and further job losses. Um, the classic was the Daily Express front pages on the same day, you might oh. remember this, where the Daily Express in, in England said your pension was at risk Aye. under George Osborne, and the Scottish version said your pension is at risk if you vote for independence. <laughs> and it was naked <laughs> propaganda, Aye. naked. It's so blatant <laughs> that it's, it's so frustrating that they can get away with when you're aware of how blatant it is and the fact that it is propaganda and the effect of that that's having on the masses, it's, mm. it's like, you know, I just want to shake the population, yeah. just grab them and shake them. That's the very point at which the public service broadcaster, the BBC, uh-huh. which, is, which is the newspapers have no obligation to be impartial, mm-hmm. but the BBC has it built into its, 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 uh, its, I can't remember the document, but its regulations mm-hmm. built into that, that it must be impartial. So surely their their first role should have been to watch the the the, the propaganda and to balance it for their their audience. So that mm-hmm. that that Daily Express art uh, behaviour mm-hmm. should have been a front page for them. But it, it should wasn't. have been it absolutely should have been. And what would have happened to the BBC as a, 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 a cooperation if we did say we did vote in September there? Like, what would have happened? Like initially, I mean, like the two year period where everything yeah. would have remained the same, but say come, was it March 2016, the actual Independence Day, came around, would they have lost out on all of the Scot- Scottish coverage or would they have kept it or retained it? It was quite a kind of grey area, I didn't know really uh, what was My going impression out. is that the, 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 SNP, the SNP are wary of direct attack on the BBC to see it as a vote loser. We saw George, John Swinney one night on one of these panel shows where he was like asked directly if the BBC was biased and he wouldn't answer the question. And, uh, and recently we had Blair Jenkins, the, the you know, chief executive mm-hmm. of the Yes campaign, saying he didn't think the BBC were systemically biased. It's a very canny choice of words, systemically. Uh, I haven't accused the BBC of being stem- systemically. Systemically means it's built into the system and they mm-hmm. spend their days planning to be biased. You know, I, I've suggested that they were, they were biased mm-hmm. and I've argued that it's, a lot of it was kind of semi-conscious, unconscious behaviour 
which is pro-unionist, but it's not something they plan. Mm -hmm. They don't sit around a cauldron saying, how can we disadvantage <laughs> no. the, the course, Yes campaign? So, so, so that was a... Blair Jenkins had set up a straw man, as it's known. He'd set up something which he could disagree with, even though it was something nobody else had said. And I, I, did, I, I was really quite disappointed with that. Th that and the, the, the attitude of the SNP towards the BBC suggests to me that, that if we did get independence or if there's more devolution of broadcasting, that there won't actually be many heads on the block, that there'll be an opportunity for those elite members of the BBC to be moved across. And, and some will retire early, and some at the level below will, will get the senior jobs, and somebody like Blair Jenkins might end up in charge of the BBC. He's been, he's been in that role before. He was a senior member of staff at the BBC. Um, but, but I think the, in the background, of course, will be the shrinking audience. As we've course, spoken I, about the I, new media coming through, mm -hmm. the BBC, I think, will continue to... He's already to commanding uh, yeah. listener figures. Well, the new media's that, already commanding it from... That's what I was going to say, you know, that you've got, like, the likes of, in America, I'm not sure if you're aware of, um, a group called the Young Turks. I've heard the term in a different context. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you can enlighten us on that. It's just, you know, we, we, know <laughs> it's about, we know about the Young Turks as just a group great. of Absolutely alternative right. media source. Yeah, and you two are Young Turks. Yeah. Uh, right, OK. Right. I mean that as a compliment. Right, OK. <laughs> um, I'm interested in this, by the way. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm trying anyway, to know. <laughs> so we can get this. <laughs> the Young Turks are now ba basically, um, we're similar in that we try and report what we believe is, you know, impartial yeah. news and what people should be talking about in yeah. a normal kind of way and discussing it at a kind of a normal level without well talking in the break about news sources having that kind of Thunderbirds fake talking uh, and they're using yes. a weird inflection in their voice. Tonight! Tonight the terror and your houses are going to burn down. That monotone and the other news, thing. you know, it's, mm -hmm. aye, it's you, you know, like the complete see. opposite from what we try and do. The complete opposite. So they've had like over a billion views on YouTube now, and that that figure is like pretty. You can't argue with that now. It's like they've they've reached a massive amount of people. And From an idea that started off in a garage, just f f vented through frustration of uh -huh. what was going on, and through the the power of communication through the internet and communicating with other people. You know, oh, did you realise this isn't right, and this and that building up mm -hmm. and building up and building up? And you're seeing it happening here in Scotland as well. Yeah. You're seeing it, I mean, we've not got it to the same extent. In the independence referendum, we've seen um, another previous guest of the show, Stephen Payton, who done the Indie Ref Weekly Great podcast mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, I'm not sure if you'd, you'd seen any of them. Um, but yeah, really, really good information. Um, again, non-biased information that was just right. purely not taking the media spin, the mainstream media view. Um, but we're not, we've not got such a spring as what America have. We've not got a, a station that has like a billion views on YouTube. We've not, not got not that quite established, yet. polished <clears throat> sort of... Not, not it, yet. It's almost as good as the mainstream as what they're spitting out with the green screen action and that, but it's not... It's I, not reckon, I, I reckon it's absolutely coming. It's coming for sure. And it's gonna, it's I think coming. it's going to hit at a point soon. Right. You're going to get the... They're called the Young Turks. The Young Turks. And it's, the, the it's the Turks, an online... Yeah. Broadcaster. Yeah, they do. Um, they do live YouTube streams, and they also that's all pre. So basically, they sit around a table, yeah. pretty much like a kind of news right. set, sort of set up. See, and, they they've actually set. got they they done a fundraising campaign, bought their own right. building, and they've got their own news network now. Right. So I'm feeling like an undergraduate now, rather than a professor, because <laughs> I didn't know about this, and it sounds like I should. Well, so really I mean, in this. Yeah. yeah, they're really they're really. Um, Between them and Joe Rogan in America, they've tied it right up. Totally. You can, I mean, you've got more people listening to Joe Rogan with guys like Graham Hancock and that on. Um, it's you breathe a sigh of relief for the society when you think if that's more yeah. popular, then that's great because you've got Bill O'Reilly shouting and bawling yeah. on Fox yeah. News, and you're like, "Oh my, what is this guy saying here?" Yeah. Uh, and but people take it in. But I'm, I'm, it's, I'm glad that it seems to be a certain sort of generation that's still at that sort of right. mindset, mm -hmm. the Bill O'Reilly mindset, you know. I'm feeling teacherly yeah. just now. I feel I should tell you where the original young Turks were. Right. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. Tell us. Tell us. You'll be, well, you could probably guess which ethnicity they were. They were Turks. Right. Um, they were they were young Turkish um, soldiers after World War One, when uh, when uh, the Ottoman Empire or Turkey had yeah. been defeated in World War One, and they wanted to restore the country, and, and they decided to get rid of the religious leaders, um, Islamic religious leaders, and make the country secular and nationalist. Um, Kemal Ataturk was the most famous and they were quite brutal, probably pretty right wing 
and they transformed uh, Turkey into the kind of semi-modern state it is today. And the term then has become popular. Churchill used, used it about um, young politicians who were ambitious. You know, you, he would pass them in the corridor, and these young politicians we thought were on the way up, mm -hmm. and he would say, ah, the young Turks. So it's still, I've, I've, I've had it used of me when I was a young academic. When I was mm. when I was looking for promotion, someone referred to me as a young Turk. So there you go. It's right. It's been it's an old term. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder how they got the name. They the absolutely got it from that. Then they yeah, must have yeah, done history. Absolutely. Too. Just wanting to be the best and most. Just pioneer you know. change. Pioneering, pioneering change. It's also about uh, yeah. It's also about very kind of hard nosed, aggressive changers. It's not kind of soft democratic sort of thing. Right. It's a, it's a group of guys that think they're quite important and think, right, this place is a mess, we are going to change it. Well, that makes sense with, with the line of, of sort of their shows and, and how they present their views because there is no BS, there's no, it's just straight down the middle talking and, and opinions and you can tell that it is, there's no agenda, there's no political influence, there's no corporate interest, it's just, this is my opinion on this subject. You know, it affects me, and this is why you should believe it affects you, and this is why you should listen and read more about it. And that's, you, you just don't really get that kind of, like the way they speak, the way they, they converse with each other, the guests they have on, you just don't get it on mainstream news. Do they have advertising? Bits and bobs, but um, you understand it because Joe Rogan, for example, he'll have uh, sponsors and adverts that are related to a lot of the subject matter of what he's talking right, about. Yeah. So, like, he'll have. An advert for like uh, Alpha Brain you're mentioning, which is like a supplement. You'd probably know a lot more about that mm -hmm. because you've actually had it. But like, mm -hmm. he'll uh, advertise like gym equipment and stuff, so and he'll be ethical, tied in. Kind of so I stuff that's it's actually, sort of related. It's beneficial things. in some sort yeah. of way to these who, who's sure, listening to him. Yeah, there's always that kind of cynical sort of fear that at some point somebody's going to make them an offer they can't refuse. I know, that's the know. thing. And then they'll suddenly Absolutely. realise they're, they're less revolutionary than they thought they were. I was watching a Bear, just quick, I was watching a Bear Grylls show last night, and Bear Grylls, I thought, was somebody who would never sell out. <laughs> and this uh, Bear's top survival tip comes on, it cuts in, blah, 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 but this tent, securing bags to your tent so it doesn't blow away. And, it's like, and this is brought to you by Walmart, uh, Walmart. You're number one for survival gear, then I'm like, <laughs> oh, Walmart no. of all people, right? You can't, you can't go that far. Bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think with that, that wonderful name he has, he would be able to replace George Foreman and sell grills. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. Yeah. Maybe one day. He's still, he's still got the, uh, the, the, the kind of drive to get in, in about Is he still know? a scout as well? He's a head scout. He's head. still a scout, yeah. A Kayla. A Kayla? I, I believe. I thought a Kayla's, when I was in the Cubs, a Kayla's, a Kayla's were women, but. But then that was maybe the Cubs, maybe you had know, women in the sure, Cubs. Sure, um, Akela. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's been a long actually. time, but I used to dib, dib, dib. Yeah. Somebody might be able to clarify that for us out there. I'm sure there's a cub or a, a cub scout. expert. <laughs> there's got to be a professor. About way people are interested in cubs. <laughs> cub professor. <laughs> <laughs> I was just looking there. You were thinking that you didn't think Bear would sell out. His uh, his dad was um, British Conservative politician Michael Grills. Sir William Michael Grills, who was uh, he was implicated in the Cash for Questions affair in the, in the <laughs> 90s. So uh, he had a probably had a, a, an educated upbringing and privileged upbringing anyway. Uh, so the sins of the fathers. That's that. Uh, uh, it's it's, it's kind of strange. But I mean, not everybody's like no, not everybody's <laughs> like their dad, though. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? Hitler's, but, uh, Hitler's wains have been pretty well behaved. <laughs> or Wayne, you know, he had one at least. <laughs> Lives in France, right? Hitler has a Hitler had a, a I think a boy who grew up in France, and I don't think I think he was a bit of a recluse. Not surprisingly, I know, not surprisingly, I'm playing Probably video games all the time. Changed his name, and <laughs> you know, well, he had changed his he had changed his name because that would have been that would have been a bit naive, wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 just, you know, who are you, uh, Hitler? No, nah, no, nah, I'm no relation. You look awfully like him, though, yeah. mate. Like You're I swear, you job. could be Hitler's son. Let me nah. put this bit of insulating <laughs> tape on your lip. You <laughs> oh, now I know it. <laughs> job interviews would have been a nightmare. Ah, oh, nightmare. Absolute dead set. You're not getting it. Well, it depends what type of job you're going for. Maybe in the That's military. Equal, oppor and equal Britain, opportunities and all that, actually. <laughs> Walmart would have taken you. Like equal opportunities, so even even my name, like that. Oh, yes, yeah. You've it has to. an entitlement to be treated like anybody else. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Oh, sure. um, Bear Grylls. Uh, I was just I was thinking there, Bear, Bear Grylls. Who was the, the other guy? Neil Oliver. Neil Oliver, you know Neil Oliver? Yes, I know who he is, yeah. Uh, have you met him? No, 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 right. no, no. I mean, I really respect the guy. 
um, for what he's done, like Coast and all that, brilliant. But I was just so surprised with his political stance, what he came out and said about the whole referendum and I that. Didn't, I didn't hear it. He was, uh, you were telling me about it, he was I really was, uh, pro-union. Uh, was he? It was mm-hmm. like the day Surprised before the referendum. A, the Did history of Scotland, you know, he was a proper... I know, yeah. Proper Scotsman. Sorry, Kim, anyway. Doesn't that just happen though, when, when you move to England and work there for a while and uh, start to think, well, my, my career now is in the BBC and it's the BBC? And, you know, so you t- I think your self interest maybe overwhelms some of your earlier values. Uh, you need to keep the, the cars and you need to keep the, the houses or whatever it may be, I suppose it does. I think when you've seen like, the, the Better Together videos coming out with the celebrities, like. Ross Kemp and you know celebrities that were just kind of saying this this rhetoric of you lose our Britishness, you know, aren't we, aren't we a family? We'll miss you, Scotland. And it was like you know we weren't going anywhere. No. We weren't splitting away for you <laughs> and, and you know in landmass. We were there was going to be no borders or you know big walls thrown up overnight. I just kind of got the impression it was just people that weren't really thinking. I kind of was offended by it because it was kind of like thinking well. The poor of Scotland, there are a lot of people that really do want independence and might have benefited from a more, you know, a smaller, more democratic nation would have prospered from it. And they, they weren't kind of aiming it at that. It was kind of like, well, things are all right as they are, aren't they? You know, you know we're, we're all right. Look mm-hmm. at us. We mm-hmm. feel part of our family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think, well, that, that relates to the research that the Edinburgh University did into the relationship between income and your attitude towards uh, independence. And uh, these, these celebrities, not surprisingly, identify with an institution that's made them wealthy, the yeah. BBC. And the Edinburgh University research showed that um, a very strong correlation, the less, the less paid you were, the less well paid you were, the more likely you were to be a yes supporter. And the, and the better paid you were, the more likely you were to be a, a no a supporter. And it's because people who work in top jobs think, well, I might be promoted to the branch in Birmingham or whatever and so on. So it's, it's natural that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was quite remarkable, the list of celebrities. I mean, I don't know what, I don't, I what they were thinking about some of those. Charles Brandreth? Is Charles Brandreth going to want to make you stay in Britain or leave it? Let me think. <laughs> oh, I yes, know. just leave it. <laughs> I I know. I mean, I mean, another, another one was that uh, the Better Together lady, the patronising lady. just about to actually mention that. That, you know, that video. With oh, the video, yeah. She's sitting there with I can't be bothered with all of this. Who I allowed that sh- to go out? Who was? Who were the people? Well, who that signed thought, that off? Uh, it was astonishingly poor quality. Oh. I've, I've got one or two colleagues on, on the, the campus down the in the air who, who do film production. They teach mm-hmm. students how to produce films and, and they, they said and this is, I'm not making this up they said uh, they would have failed it mm-hmm. because it lacked imagination it lacked uh, dynamism it was just that straight it interview so with a point of the really offensive I it's really like offensive it's, it's so patronising it's exactly the vibe I got from it when I was watching it I was yeah. like I cannot believe it and you're not I, even a woman I, and I wasn't even a <laughs> novel he's, he's not a woman <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't even a novel or no, I, mean, yeah. I, was, it's, I wonder what they thought of it I know well, I personally Did it know, work with any people? I personally yeah. know a, a no voter that changed his mind to, to yes after seeing from that. seeing that he was so embarrassed at the video and, and saying it was so condescending and so patronising towards not only, you know, just um, yes voters and people thinking that might be voting hard, yes, so vote no. Thinking right well what, what do we not care for our family? Do we not care for mm-hmm. our kids? Do we not work jobs? Do we not have time yeah. to do things? Do we not think about politics? Do we not know who that guy off the telly is? Are we that stupid? Mm-hmm. You know, and it was that kind of like, who signed that off? But again, I hope, again, it probably ties whole, in with that whole yeah. propaganda. The whole no campaign was, was characterised by mistakes of that kind all the way down the line. And it makes it all the more galling, really, in a sense that the yes campaign was so joyous and exciting and positive, the no campaign was so miserable, and yet in the end still won. And that's, that's hard to take, but you know, really it's not hard. over, obviously. It really is. Uh, it's hard to take, and it isn't over. But, I mean, what, what's your thoughts on like, um, the whole way the votes were counted? Oh, that. Right. Like, because for me, like, in this day and age, in 2014, going into uh, the polling station and getting a tick against some, I didn't even see what it was, getting a tick, and handed this bit of paper that was just a bit of paper, uh-huh. and went away done the business, come back, and it was gone. I couldn't remember any sort of barcode or whatever on the bit of paper. It was just... Yeah. For me, I would have thought, right, electronically, they've got everybody's face on database. they get some sort of system where they know who's voted, and it's going in, it's getting logged in the computer, and you can, it's just a bit more of a, a sort of yeah. a professional setup for something, for the magnitude of what we were actually voting for. Yeah. And all of these boxes just got brought into this hall, and it was just a load of people in, seemed to be counting yeah. willy-nilly. For me, it just lacked 
credibility, the whole yeah. lot of it. And, and well, it liked independent observers, which was one of the most obvious things that yeah. I, I was concerned about beforehand. It was this kind of assumption that you didn't need independent observers here. You know, this is not the Ukraine, this is not Nigeria or whatever. <coughs> so that kind of that kind of elitist view of the UK. There should have been independent observers. There clearly were um, errors of judgment. I mean, the use of over large rooms so that you can't oversee what's happening. I don't, I don't doubt for a minute there will have been malpractice. I do doubt whether it'll have been enough to cause the gap. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the difference in the vote, I think, I think to achieve that by these kind of quite amateurish methods, I, I don't think that's... Yeah, that's an interesting case. point. There may have been bits and bobs I think there will have been, yeah. here I, I, and there, but whether or not it amounts to 10,000, 5,000 yeah. or a couple of hundred... Yeah, probably not enough to account for the Probably difference. not 400,000. No. I think the scare, I think the scare score is in the last few days... And there's some evidence that um, I think there's evidence. I can't remember where I read it. That um, f- 25% of the no vote indicated that they had voted no because of the promise of extra powers. So that's in that the, would, the thing that's you a big about, one. You think about the daily records. You just think about how much they've got to answer for, and you understand why the, the, it's plummeted their their figures. People uh, buying it just went straight down. Same with the, the Sunday Mail. The Scotsman, um, however, have grown. Sunday Herald have grown. Yeah, a lot. Well, they, the, the Herald have grown, but the Scotsman have grown in the same way because right. the Scotsman nailed its colours to the mask quite early, and the Scotsman featured lots of very anti-independence articles. So it was quite clear where it stood, and its 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 figures went up. So it's kind of like supporters are splitting between the Scotsman and the the Sunday Herald. Mm-hmm. Um, I that's, that's, that's I thought it was like, quite bold of the Sunday Herald, but at the same mm-hmm. time I thought right for almost half of the country, and we've got the Sunday Herald representing that. And that's all. So yeah. it just seems so unfair to actually what was happening. As you would think, yeah. apart from setups like like the Fiery Scots here or other sort of independent uh, um, alternative news sort of platforms, the Sunday Herald was. Yeah, got to bear in mind these are awesome, these man. are very small readerships. I mean, the the Sunday Herald before its growth was about twenty hundred thousand. I mean, these are tiny compared to some websites, obviously. Tiny compared to the crucially tiny compared to BBC News at six. Yeah. So that, that's the, the the main area that really requires the focus, mm-hmm. because if anything did sway opinion, then it will have been BBC coverage, mm-hmm. be, um, because it, was, it has a big audience. It's, it's that audience watches yeah. religiously six o'clock at night. You know, it's it, and and its headlines are peppered through the show from six o'clock. Um, I, if there's been any measurable media effect um, against the yes vote, then the BBC is a major part of that. For oh, sure, like as as we said, you know we've said so many times on the show before that for a lot of people, life is is going to work early in the morning, seven, eight, nine o'clock, and coming back, shattered, drained, you know, having to deal with issues, like family issues, other personal issues, that they simply don't devote the time to researching or keeping up with current affairs and the have their dinner, they flick on what they believe is the news, you know, in inverted commas, but really it's just what seems to be elite people telling middle class people to tell poor people what to think, you know, and it's, it's it, that's what it seems to be to me, and, and until we break that cycle and break, we're definitely moving towards, you know, more, more people taking it in through the internet and through alternative news sources, but until we break that corporate power and, and the, the mainstream power that exists then I, t- you know, I, I don't know I, I, don't I, know. I can't I, I think they're breaking gonna go, the cycle because I, I mean we've got the internet now, the internet's fairly established in Scotland, we've got you know the, the age of voting was 16, it was low to 16 so we had that populace we had that chance of, of tapping into it and we're still seeing with the project fear and the mainstream media just the, the, the bias and the lack of coverage of positive stories for yes, and the lack of critique on staying together and, and the union, just that was for me. That's what you've seen a win off. It wasn't a win of you know voting fraud or, or votes going missing and, and and a big conspiracy. It was a win for for the media, for mainstream media, and it was shown that they still have that power. But I think 1.6 million people is is only going to grow. Especially it has been when grown. you, it has when been you grown. see no how doubt. it's been spread. No doubt about it, it's been grown. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it looks bright, but we need to keep people engaged with the politics and keep them, you know, interested in, 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 in the subjects that are relevant, like fracking, like something that's right on our doorstep right now that is Westminster or, 
are just letting happen enough <coughs> without a democratic say in Scotland. So I when mean, it's, it's supposedly about a greener future and renewables, and going back to the the environmental minister, he's saying fracking is a necessary step towards a greener future, <laughs> and there's like 400. What is it? 400 million gallons of water that's got to go get pumped down one well, and that's like 400 tankers. So already you've got tankers mm. taking the water that's got to go down along with the eight toxic chemicals, the mix with the fracking fluid. There's over six. And, and that's a step towards a greener future, according to the Tory Aye. environmental minister. And the leave it just half seems of so that water, disconnected with the real actual life. They actually leave half of the water down in the earth anyway. They don't even extract half of the water. They get like 30% the I've read out. Is that and that's like what, go, gauging on what's happened in America. So the best way to do it is gauge on what's actually happening. Aye. Like what's happening and you're looking at videos where you've got a guy holding up a glass of uh, water that's came from a tap and it's it's been tested for heavy metals, it's been tested for actual mm. gas, it's because the gas is getting displaced all underneath all these towns. And these, the, the thing is about this as well is that the gas, you know, the water wasn't like that previously before the fracking companies were there because obviously you could argue that, well, of course not. was the water always that way? How long has the water been that way? Is it a result of this? And it has been, you know, the, the companies in America have had to give payouts to families now. And the, they already said they would the, do that here. Like Dark Energy says any house affected will be given 20 grand. But like twenty grand is nothing on what they're due to make. So it's an admission of the risk. Isn't so, it? Sorry, your your soil and your back garden's totally uh, totally gubbed, and your your water supply. And you can't go for a shower because you can't trust it. Sorry about that, but there's twenty grand while we are running yeah. away. It with shows billions that billions or millions or whatever. It shows that it's a corporate mentality, which is which is basically inhuman and lacking in empathy. It's a kind of inhuman is a great way to put it. It's totally inhuman. They, they they think they think of profits. And they think, wait a minute, this may cause some damage. Therefore, we'll put in place already. We'll into our costing. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll take out insurance <laughs> and so on. So we, it's almost like they 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 know it's coming. That all previous industrial uh, the industrial processes have had negative consequences on somebody. You know, the the, the large number of elderly gentlemen in Scotland with with asbestosis and so on. That, that kind of died thing. of asbestosis right from the shipyards. Yeah. Uh, damn you as well. Um, Mal is it Malcolm's? But they can Turner's, take that. Turner's asbestos yeah. factory is like oh, totally, yeah, yeah. totally affected so many. But the corporations yeah. plan for that mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. it's, that tells us something. It tells us that they know. They know <laughs> there's a very high risk of that, even though they won't say it. Mm -hmm. Why do you take out the insurance? Why do you make these offers if you don't think it's going to happen? It's because they know it's going to happen and they'll absorb the costs and they'll pick up and move somewhere else. And that's that. And know. then they'll leave places where they've, the licenses have been granted. Look, Coat Bridge and, and Falkirk where they've started already and they'll just yeah. leave these places once they've been they've fracked the well 18 times and they've been underneath people's houses and before you know it you've not even got a leg to stand on because the right's been stripped away from you without you knowing before <laughs> it, They say it's to bring down energy costs as well of course and that doesn't make sense yeah. because fracking's only financially you know it's only profitable when energy prices are high anyway so like you know, disregarding the, envi the horrendous environmental risks that are involved, you know, the earthquakes, the water pollution, like we've mentioned, you know, people lighting their taps, going up to their <laughs> taps and lighting the water coming out. And that's the big... It's I don't understand why they go to all the measures of putting up road works and road signs and all that to keep people safe when yeah. um, they're, they're, they're passing licenses to frack underneath the house, underneath your house and potentially affect the, the very thing you rely on to live. The scary thing for me personally is that when you hear the political organisations that are coming out in support of fracking, and it is unfortunately, you know, the SNP have came out and said, you know, being around the bush, you know, with re with robust regulations, that robust and, regulations and strict management, nothing and robust. In other words, I will do it, and we'll keep, we'll keep an eye on it. But do we really want to just do it in the first place? We can't do it. Scotland's like, got the best water. Probably this is <laughs> what, what you just described is, is, is really interesting in the context of the massive growth of the SNP. And a lot of people that have joined the SNP, I think, in this last period are to the left of the SNP. Mm -hmm. There are people who have abandoned the, the traditional left and they've joined the SNP, and I think they'll want to change the SNP. The SNP may actually come to regret some of its new members. That's and, a fair point. And, and let's hope they do come to regret, regret that, because the SNP requires to be pulled to the left to be made more democratic 
I mean, it's done a tremendous job in in raising the profile of Scottish independence and perhaps in achieving it, but we don't have to accept them as a final product. And and let's hope that the SNP becomes more democratised by this massive influx and by all the online association as well, and maybe change their tune. I mean, I I hope it's the beginning, that independence is the beginning and and that NATO is not forever. You know, we can still work on that. We can work on the royal family, we can work on all the other negatives that the SNP seem afraid of dealing with. Mm-hmm. I spoke to an SNP supporter some, some time ago who said to me, he touched me on the, on the arm as if to say, you know, relax, don't worry, when I talked about the royal family, NATO, and, uh, and some other things. Like, the, the economic policy, mm-hmm. corporation tax, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. He touched me on the, on the arm and said, don't worry, we just don't want to scare the horses. And I think that probably sums it up. You know, that? The, get independence, <sighs> then deal with these Aye, things later. One step at a time, it's yeah. too much for the population to think of. Because personally, mm-hmm. I don't want the pound. I think that we should go, in today's 21st century, I think it'd be better and more transparent and fairer if we went towards a cryptocurrency, something like Bitcoin, huh? something like that. It'd where be very, initially, to go full on that would be a bit of a risk. Well, I think... Do you know what I think? I, when you look at Iceland... Like, say, say for like such a, an, el- an elderly population as well, like, to sort of thrust... An idea uh, uh, like cryptocurrency on to somebody like that, right? This Let's, is now. I've what's just happening. thought. I've just thought of my mum, <laughs> <laughs> Bitcoin. <laughs> so this is it now. This is currency. So what you do is you go to this much. website and you do this and you do that. It's it's a bit much, but it's what you're much, saying is right though. But what what it is, I'm not going to go mega into the depth on Bitcoin, but it, all transactions are completely transparent. They're on the blockchain. You can see it. It's visible for everybody. So there's not going to be any secret dealings. There's no it's 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 really revolutionary. Well, Scott coin's already a thing. You can get Scott coin. Yeah, Scott coin. But Bitcoin in general is is it's, it's growing massively, and the fact that you can only ever get twenty one million bitcoins That's in right. circulation at any one time. That's so, it's limited. Aha! Uh-huh, so they can't just keep ploughing in. Oh, there's another twenty million mm-hmm. in. We're going to give it to this guy and going to give him better deal. It's not. It's completely decentralised. There's no money federal system. reserves. Just continually. And it's mining money at something that doesn't exist. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> this. Yeah, it's, it's really. If, if, if you've not looked much in it, I'd no, really, I it's no. really interesting. No. It's, it's it will be the future. It's again, it's the people yeah. taking serious matters into their own hands, in like the future. Bitcoin. And that's the that's the ultimate to power grab for us. Like a people power grab is taking away the power from the centralised governments. And we talk about corporate control. and We talk about government control or whatever. Mm. You know, who are the people that are giving them money in the first place? Well, it's your world banks and your IMFs and, you know, these are the people that are printing the money. Who who, who, uh, who audits the Federal Reserve? Who 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 controls these people? And they Will they allow Bitcoin to, to succeed? Well, listen, no, there's a, there's a massive, massive... Massive smear campaign already kicked aye, off about it. You've got massive corporations coming out saying, no, 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 it's dangerous... You've seen companies, you've seen countries coming out saying don't use it. It's a haven for drug deals and this um, and that sort of thing. But I see, when you think about drug deals, see if they just... Personally, I think if they legalised the drugs, took the power away from the gangs <coughs> and regulated it so there was a cleaner, safer... A people, people are going to do drugs sure. anyway, no matter if they're legal or whether they're illegal. It's proven the war on drugs clearly is something that's not really working. If they Probably actually took created the power a bigger back. market for drugs and made it, you know, romanticised the idea yeah. of, look, there's a bit well, of danger even, in it. Yeah. There's, there's clearly a bit of a, an opinion shift on this in recent years where you've had uh, chiefs of police in England actually speaking in favour of legalisation. Mm-hmm. I've been in favour of legalisation for, you know, virtually all my adult life. Mm-hmm. And it's not because I want massive access to, you know, to, to these sort of substances. It's because, uh, as you, you pointed out earlier, that they actually creates a, a, a creates a reason for crime, it creates Absolutely a justification does. for crime, and it creates smuggling a things effects. across borders yeah. and all of this. People are going. To, there's a massive demand for drugs. Why not regulate it and also make yourself some money to plough into roads and schools and mm. things for your community? Exactly. It seems like a total. Not only that, what we're seeing is like since the 1950s, we've been fed um, this story that. A lot of drug, well, all drugs are bad for you, especially you know psychological drug. Uh, Drugs are bad for you. LSD, psilocybin, that's a you know active compound of magic mushrooms. All these drugs are really bad for you. There's no medicinal value in them. Yet nowadays, with with the you know the joys of modern science and the techniques of extrapolating, um, you know going down at a basic subatomic level into these compounds and stuff, <laughs> these products like magic mushrooms, 
we're noticing that wait a minute they've got great great uses on, on the For the likes of depression and PTSD anxiety depression magic mushrooms been used for and, and is coming out with fantastic results like reviewed peer reviewed with science and, and these, these papers they, you can't argue with them it's not propaganda like what you've seen with cannabis before in America was documentary reefer madness going out you know mm. and they were saying you know the blacks and the Mexicans at the time they were smoking it and it would send you crazy and you don't want to be like them and you know that propaganda affected a lot of people and it affects a lot of, it's affected a massive generation of people but now know. you're seeing you know with, with, with science you're seeing that it's got its, its, its uses on a medicinal level it's curing a as lot opposed of to going to the doctors and, and just getting hit in the face with antidepressants like, take them this happy pills it. like selling somebody that you've hit the t- nail in the head is that the, peop- the main people that oppose the legalisation of drugs have to be the people that are going to lose the most amount of money out of that. And if you legalise drugs, like say, for instance, you legalise cannabis, one like of the pharma. things that cannabis helps, supposedly helps with, is sleep. The people that make Eating sleeping pills, like they're going to lose money out of that. So all your benzodiazepines are, are gone. That market's gone. Your, your Valium, that's, it's gone overnight. And these people have got a maybe 200, 300 million pound interest in that market so I mean they're going to be the ones that are pushing out the propaganda mm. the alcohol producing companies are the main ones putting out these researches that are slating drugs but yeah this is again you're, you're seeing a mainstream media that are putting out one image but I think that's changing with drugs with certainly a lot of drugs mm-hmm. especially looking at the likes of like Portugal that we've mentioned on the show before when they've changed their drug laws and, and went to support drug addicts rather than chastise them and, and paint them as these sort of horrendous verrucas in the soul of society it's like more like well how can we how can we educate them and how can we make it more cleaner and, and not yeah. this dirty you know you can go up when you're 12 years old to a drug dealer and buy drugs and how do we change this how do we how do we make it so like, many unnecessary you know? deaths to do with like in Glasgow like ecstasy and cocaine use and it's always going to yeah. happen but the reason it's happening is because this rogue batch ends up appearing somewhere that could have clearly been stopped and regulated if it was all controlled in such a manner. Well, I think yes. like what you're seeing with um, like cannabis in America and, and, and certainly in, in parts of Holland and parts of the continent is uh, in Europe, that with it being legalised um, at a medicinal level and in just a recreational level, you're seeing a change in opinion. And when something becomes legal, it becomes less cool to do. Or, or you know, you've seen that in Holland. When we seen, we were speaking to some people when we were over there in Amsterdam. They were like 16, 17, and never smoked and weren't interested in smoking at all because it was like, well, you, you can do that if you want, but mm, mm-hmm. there's other things to do. You can mm-hmm. do that, and it was like they've been given that choice. They can go there and get this clean, un, unfiltered. You know, you, it's been it's been ca- categorized from seed to growth totally cleanly it's not mm-hmm. been some shady drug dealer that will sell to uh, some 12 year old in the street that's been sprayed with <laughs> some horrendous drug to mm. make it and that's the reality of that, how that's it is the, here that's the world that we live in just now mm. and, and the reality is is that this plant that is that's coming out of science has got so many uses people aren't never mind being allowed the fact to that it's action. actually not responsible for any deaths any deaths but we've also got a conspiracy here. I'm not sure if you're aware of this one. In the UK, there is actually a bit of a conspiracy. That there's a company called GW Pharmaceuticals, and they have two massive factories down in England, and they grow cannabis. Just the government grows cannabis. It is mainly conservative politicians that have got massive shares in this company, and they grow mass amounts of cannabis, and they they make it into this product called Sativex which is just like a liquid form. They say that, um, that it's not, it's the it's taking out the harmful ingredients of cannabis, the ones that are really, you know, the bad ones that make you psycho, and putting in all the good ones. And they sell that back to the NHS at five times the price at what it costs them to make. And it's like, they've taken control, on one hand saying that that's a class B scheduled drug that has no medicinal value to you, but yet we can grow it and sell it back to the NHS and and, and, and we can do that legally yeah. and make money off it. But there's no medicinal value in it for you. How in the world can they get away with that when, you know, mm-hmm. it just seems absurd. So when they're profiting out of something that is illegal and also profiting out of charging people and fining people and having an, a criminal system yeah. that's set up 
to constantly keep people in jail and moving towards a private prison prison system yeah. where there's profit in that when people get incarcerated. It seems like there's more money to be made when you're elitist and in control of this off of it being illegal totally, than it being yeah. legal. Absolutely. Because you're getting free labour from people going to jail. So. Well, this is that. Profit is the only principle of capitalism. There's no worry about double standards or mm -hmm. about lack of ethics or about damaging. It's about profit. Profit, mm -hmm. profit, profit. And and we, so we get we get what, what you get under capitalism. Everything we have is under capitalism. Our health center is the our health services are the health services you get under capitalism. Our, our military are the the military you get under capitalism. Yeah. They're all determined. Their their activities are all determined by the profit motive at some point and the fight for resources. Um, I mean, I think that's something that's ever going to change. <laughs> well, everything well, everything does change. I mean, obviously, I mean, uh, it's obviously built in this. I mean, we haven't had capitalism for that long. I mean, the human human beings have been allegedly civilized. Um, we've been living in urban civilization for about maybe five, six, seven thousand years at the mm -hmm. most. You know, that's at the tail end of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. Um, prohibition only. How long did prohibition last in the United States? I don't know. Twenty or thirty years, mm -hmm. or a bit less than that. So alcohol it, prohibition. Yeah, alcohol prohibition. So I mean, I I don't doubt that there'll be an end to the prohibition of of a lot of drugs. I don't doubt that'll happen, but it it will require it will require somebody to find alternatively a way of making a profit out of them becoming legalised. I think it's dangerous as well. It's not only is it there's a lot of profit um, and just keeping it illegal just now, but it's dangerous because it, drugs you know they change people's perceptions of the world. They change people's the way people's brains are wired. You know yeah. really at, at that kind of That's level. Absolutely right. You've got you know people coming out saying that they take these psychoactive drugs like ayahuasca and ibogaine and. And they're having almost spiritual experiences and coming out of it, coming out of it being with more a knowledge informed. And, and, uh, with a knowledge, I want to protect the world. You know, and that instance, seems to be a recurring theme with ayahuasca: mm -hmm. is save the world. <clears throat> and you know, maybe it's the conspiracy head in me that's thinking, who would not want people to save the world, and who would want <laughs> to not want people having that thing? But you uh, always wonder. You know, you question say, this, and never say never. This, I, I think you are seeing a move towards with the internet and, and the freedom of information, the way it spreads and the, the amount of information that's out there on, on drugs and you are seeing a change. Like People know it's an ideological war on drugs. I mean, a yeah. war on drugs. Just thinking about that war on Mother Nature. <laughs> really, it, it makes no sense. It's, it's just like it desensitises us to the word war. I think we're close though to a big change of some kind, and you, you've ended up there. And it's what um, some people call a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. That when uh, when yeah. you get change in society or in technology or in economics or whatever, it tends not to be a gradual change. There are tipping points mm -hmm. at which suddenly the system will flip over. A hundred monkey sort of effect. I, I don't know that term, but I can imagine it. Are these in a pyramid? These monkeys? <laughs> well, it's, uh, have, you, have you never heard that before? No, no, I don't know. So you went to me. It was a, it was an interesting one. It was um, research that were doing these Indian. I'm sure it was Indian uh, scientists that were doing research on monkey monkeys, and they taught them to wash potatoes. Uh -huh. Just just like one monkey that was young, yeah. and it went back to its family, and and taught the older ones, and then other <coughs> families learnt. and it was like other families started washing their potatoes uh -huh. and it was just specific to this one island and this one little group of monkeys and then suddenly there was like a point where it was like this row of like a whole whole section of islands that were like disconnected like they were not connected they were separated by water monkeys can't swim but suddenly monkeys in other islands started washing their potatoes uh -huh. and this is like document you can go on to like with, it's on with, with no exchange of they had, they had no 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 contact. Right. So they they thought it was a weird thing. They called it the hundred monkey effect. Like there becomes a tipping point. Yes. Tipping when point. like so many people so know something in a society yeah. that eventually just it's like everybody knows it. It's mm. just like I think a if common. That happens with monkeys. Yeah. How many how many examples of that? If that that's actually. True. Well, if that's true, you know, how does that translate into humans or other animals? Mm. And it is, is it you're just you born a, and you, you have a this certain ability, and, and all of a sudden, when you look at like the Egyptians, mm -hmm. it might have been this knowledge that allowed them to build the pyramids, but at the mm. same time, in South America, they're also building pyramids. I don't know, it's very fascinating. Well, that's a complex one. I don't know anything about pyramids. But if I, I, I think I am. They are. 
I know how to. I used to teach in a primary school, so I know how to calculate a number of vertices and so on in pyramids. But that's my my limit there. Go, going back briefly to the the, the business of drug um, mm -hmm. legislation yeah. in the UK, mm -hmm. um, I think the media coverage is is, is an indicator of of the fact that we might be lead, leading to this tipping point, mm -hmm. this paradigm shift. Uh, and one of one of the undergraduate students on the Hamilton campus last year did a study of media reporting of drugs, and 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 she found over the last uh, twenty thirty years a definite shift in the content of newspaper coverage of drugs yeah. away from um, enthusiasm for the war on drugs towards starting to talk about legalising. Mm -hmm. And that might suggest that they, 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 not that the media are going to cause the tipping point, they may be contributing to it. Maybe they're the preparing media, for it. The media may be giving you a sign that it's coming. Mm -hmm. And especially when you, see, when you see establishment figures like chiefs of police in one or two English cities who are obviously saying, we have the evidence that it's not working. But, but are now starting to feel free to criticise it, which maybe they weren't ten years ago. There might be that somewhere down the road, maybe not that far, there'll be a flip and certain drugs will be legalised. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and who knows what comes from that, but presumably, hopefully, an improvement. I think it'll be a yeah. period, though, where it'll be like chaos until the novelty wears off. You think just like... You know, like if it all of a sudden, tomorrow, Monday, let drugs were legal in Scotland, there'd be a period of maybe... A year or two, maybe more, of just sheer carnage. I think it would all depend on how how drugs were legalised. You know, how how is the approach? I mean, what are the main factors behind legalising drugs? Well, if you look at like, say, for instance, I'd love cannabis, to just, the medicinal use is, would hopefully be the f main factor. Oh, well, so certainly a massive factor. But the fact is, is that the war on drugs was, you know, one of the main factors was to try and prevent access and youth access to drugs. But if anything, it's grown. Mm -hmm. There's like a wider access to drugs yeah. now, and it's easier. To, well, if not, it's just the same price as before. But now it's like we need. How do we? How do we legalize it? We legalize it with right. Well, this is the laws. This is you can buy it from this shop. This shop gets this license, and they have to go through these regulations. And it and it needs to be that way. It can't just be right tomorrow. It's legalized because then there would be. Yeah, it's, it's baby steps, isn't it? Ah, uh, it's baby steps, and like what you're seeing in America, it's a it's a long process, and it'll be there'll be teething problems. There'll be, mm. you know, like what you're seeing in America, it's different because they have, you know, a federal law and then a state law, mm -hmm. and then, you know, so you're seeing shops like some states will have like ca uh, legal cannabis at a recreational level, but a federal level it's still illegal. So shops. So the FBI are, can roll in and shut it all down. Still, it's the like local police are fine. The the you know local councillors are mm -hmm. fine. The mayor's fine. The shops allow to operate, they're legal, but they're illegal at a federal level. And that just seems, you know, weird. But again, <laughs> it's America, so it's not here. Sure. I mean, it, it highlights again the problem with wars, wars against anything. Mm -hmm. Wars against Islam, wars against terror, wars against drugs, wars against uh, anything you can think of. The mentality's wrong, mm -hmm. because the mentality is, is heavy-handed and counterproductive that to launch a war against anything destabilises the whole environment around it yeah. and often causes a blowback effect as well. But, uh, we need to start thinking in different ways. It's like, when, again, back to the referendum, when people talked about Scotland punching above its weight <laughs> uh, here in the world because we're part of Britain. And, and, and I, think, I think it was Patrick Harvey who, who, who said, uh, the Green Leader, I think Patrick, Patrick Harvey said, can't we stop punching? <laughs> Let's stop punching people. <laughs> And I thought that that's just about right. It's, it's, the, it's the wrong starting point, and it, it's always counterproductive. I can't think of a single case of a strategy described as the war on you know, the war on poverty. Mm. <laughs> war on poverty. There's a failure for you. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, ironic, isn't it? Because it's, if it was a real war, they would probably be putting actual money in it. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, like right. you know, for, like the war on terror. Well, you all know that. You know, you look at the facts of America's military spending. Like America yeah. alone, obviously we're. Well, our opinion is that we're America's lapdog. America's military spending is all of the rest of the world's combined. It doesn't even equate to America no, what they no. spend on military. There's a there's a, a story from an, an earlier time again than than you two will remember, but uh, the Vietnam War in the you know in the sixties and seventies, mm -hmm. the Americans invested very heavily in that. I mean, mm -hmm. just the sheer hardware that they dropped on Vietnam. There was a survey at the time I, I remember, and I don't know how scientific the survey was, but it suggested that instead of bombing and, and fighting in, in Vietnam over a period of about 10 years or more, um, if the Americans had actually just given something like about a million dollars to every family in Vietnam, it would have cost less. 
to just, you know, so, you know, the, the, the Christian thing, I'm not a Christian, but the Christian thing, you know, about giving, it seems uh-huh. to actually, maybe that would work better, actually, just, you know, let's go make friends, let's, let's aid, 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 and the same in the Arab world, aid, aid would be far more effective than, than, than the punishment. I know, but then you don't have that fear, though, fear yeah. just seems to, you know, strike them harder and they don't want to rise up, well, I don't know that, in fact, because look at, look at Iraq, you've got IS rising and... You know, we've had the Western media and the, you know us going in there and hitting them with the fear and hitting them with the bombing and look what we've created out of that. So, is it a case of we need to go in and rather than bombing them, let's go in and help them and try and make friends of course, now rather you than? You think so? We often confuse them, of course, by going in first with force and then trying to rebuild all the roads and the, the hospitals and so on. And with, with conf- contractors that are also... Right. must be very confusing for the locals to be on the be. one hand battered into the ground the next minute. How, would you like a new road here? <laughs> uh, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> well, I can't walk anymore. <laughs> when you look at the, the Halliburton, when yeah. you look at how much they profited out of the Iraq war, and they, li- they got the contract for mm. rebuilding big parts of Baghdad and... You know, as you say, it must be, if you're a local, you must be scratching your head going, wait a minute, we've just been bombed, yet now the oil's now owned by a, an American company, a water board is owned by an American company. Where is, is this money going back into our country? Is it, and it's not, it's, it's just a power grab, a corporate a lot of it's, power grab. Yeah. A lot of it's the, the taxation of, of the working people in the imperial power. Basically, they're, they're taxed to, to pay for the weapons, and then when the weapons are used, they're taxed to pay for the rebuilding. So, you know, in, in many ways, it's the people back home pay quite a heavy price. I mean, obviously not the heavy price that the victims of the bombing pay. Mm-hmm. But, but, the people, you know, the empires are not good for their own people either. The British, the British Empire was a, was a terrible time for the people of Glasgow and, you know, the people of the industrial belt. I mean, it, yeah. it, empires, empires punish everybody. Only benefit a very few. Yeah. I think it was all controlled from the same place. That. I mean, when's it going London to? Th- when is this Western control going to stop? Is it? Is it? Well, you know, we're seeing stories. I've seen circul- uh, circulating in the press last week. I think it was Business Insider, and the website that's seen that China has now overtaken America as the wealthiest nation. But how does that translate into actual world politics and you know power? And are you ever going to see anybody topple America's power? And you know, we're going to see World War Three. There's so many questions and. I always say like the, the the actual personnel in the Chinese military like outnumbers America, don't they? Yeah, want the infantry certainly. Yeah. But I mean, it's actually like how you'd mobilise them yeah. if they were ever. You have to. Look, I mean, I think we can we can look with a wee bit of optimism actually with the growth of 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 an alternative power structure in in the world with China and and with Russia still quite strong. Is that Russia have hardly ever invaded anybody. The, virtually all of Russia's major fighting has been in defence against the French, against the Germans, and then and then latterly the the, the the capitalist powers surrounding them after the revolution. China equally. China has, has obviously invaded some of its neighbouring states in the past, Tibet and so on. But but they, they, they've never projected themselves across the globe in the way that the British, the French, or the Americans have done. Yeah, you've, you've got this sort of feeling that the Russians are a massive threat and that it's they need dealt with. That rhetoric that's getting yeah. spat out. And we, we need to be in all these other places and Russians yeah. are big bad and then... Mm-hmm. It's really... It's, it's interesting you to need to step to right out. Uh, to really Russians themselves it. are quite interesting when they talk about it. Russians are, are, are quite paranoid. Um, but justifiably, you would argue, because they look at all these times in history when Napoleon and Hitler and so on tried to dominate them. And then before that, it was, it was Genghis Khan and the, you know, the Mongol horde and so on. Russia's experiences largely have been invaded. They've attacked one or two other people like Chechnya and so on, and after World War II, they came into Europe. Mm-hmm. But they hadn't started the whole thing. And then China, China, was, was, point, subject really to, China was subject mm-hmm. to tremendous kind of uh, imperial pressure from the Western powers. Little bits of China were, like Hong Kong, were, mm-hmm. were nibbled away. And then, uh, you, you might know, we, we, we fought a war over opium with the mm-hmm. Chinese when the Royal Navy was used to bombard Chinese towns to, to force them to take opium. Yeah. We were pushers on a global scale. There was a, a Scottish company as well, was at the heart of it. But too. <laughs> She's not ashamed something of was the, uh, the, the United Fruit Company or something as well? Were they not something? Are they not in Central America, United Fruit? I don't know. Or was that another one of my I'm, I'm not sure. The, com- uh, the company we did the opium thing, the, the growing the opium in India and then selling it to China and you know, really kind of affecting Chinese society. Mm-hmm. It was a Scottish company or, or a Scottish owner 
and it just their name, like McTaggart or Bannatyne or something like that. Mm -hmm. I choose these names carefully. <laughs> Bannatyne, no, it wasn't Bannatyne, but, <laughs> <laughs> but but the but the guy who ran it looked quite like him. <laughs> um, I mean, I like you say. I mean, we fought wars over opium. We fought wars. It always seems to be at the heart of it seems to be over resources and having yeah. control over these resources. Yeah. But it's like short term gain, right? So, I mean, where can we really, really see ourselves in like 50 to 100 years as a, a civilization? Like this, this short term grab of fossil fuels and uh, meat and, and like chicken and all of that, that's all got to, it's, go, it's going to implode at one point. It just can't, we can't continue this you can't sustain Consumption. the way things no. are produced and manufactured and like this global yeah. People are so disconnected uh, for how that animal arrives in that packet in the supermarket, for yeah. example. The hope, the hope for us lies in the, the education and the democratisation of young people in, in countries like China. Because if, if, the, if, the, if the population in China becomes fully educated, then you can't stop them becoming politically educated as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that might lead to China. If we don't, if we don't start a war against them, uh -huh. We just leave them for a bit because they're projecting their power entirely through economics. They're not invading Africa or anything like that. We did. They're trying to control the economic and resources of China. Yeah, they're they're, of, of, of they're Africa. doing that here as well. Yeah. I mean, like, um, I've heard a few stories about Grain Grangemouth in that area and with the, yeah. the fracking companies going in there. There's a lot of kind of Chinese links here and there. Oh, right. Um, they have them. industrial interests as well. Of oh, course. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no denying that. that they, but uh, mm. somehow that's, I mean, that's pretty awful what they're, some of the things that Chinese um, corporations, if I can call them that, are doing. But, but it, it, it's not quite the same as, as the, the, you know, the imperial approach that we had and the Americans have of know, actually definitely. getting in there and bombing and so on. Um, they do create some wealth. The Chinese corporations have, have actually helped Africa's on the up in terms of the experience of the average African. A lot of African countries becoming so what are they, what are they, more for exactly, What are the Chinese actually going in? majority doing in Africa then? Well, they're, they're, they're largely um, swapping technology for resources. Right, so um, they're going in and look, maybe... They're, they're building roads, roads and railways and, and factories and so on. And they're, and they're getting resources cheap, raw materials cheap, which, of course, is infuriating the Western corporations because <coughs> the mm -hmm. Western corporations want, the, want the, the raw materials in return for giving some money to a military elite there, mm -hmm. you know, who will control the population. At least the, the Chinese approach is slightly more ethical, I'd say. Absolutely. Not great, but it's exploitative. Absolutely. But, uh, mm -hmm. And if you're saying that it's Africa's on the up, then it, it's better than being blown to smithereens, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'd say so. Well, it was, it was Africa's, again, America have obviously know that it's a dangerous one. Yeah. Like with Colonel Gaddafi, he wanted to get Africa to unite the Afro. under a gold, a gold standard yeah. and, and, and have this... Um, an actual currency. Well, stop, it was actual to stop value. trading in the uh, US dollars, wasn't it? To no, stop trading I, oil, he wanted to stop that. He wanted all, uh, all Western companies to, to buy in, in this, uh, this gold standard um, that would be all African countries would use and, and benefit off of their own oil. And, you know, that sounds like something that the Western media didn't want. That was, you know, there was a lot of things to do with Libya that I thought were interesting. You know, the fact they had like free, el free electricity and when they got married, they got subsidies off the government. What was the figure they got? If you got married, you got yeah. twenty grand or something. You know, like. it was it was a it was a significant sum anyway, mm -hmm. and it didn't seem to be a. Again, obviously, there, there would have been horrendous things things uh, to do with the regime, elements of fascism, elements yeah. of a dictatorship. Which that, the media would have played on big time. That, that obviously you have to condemn, but at the same time. You have to question if, if these guys are the monsters or what they're made out to be by our media when we know that they're so biased on other subjects. But, you know, like you say, when you see Saddam Hussein portrayed in the media as this guy that's killing tens of thousands of people and is against women and is against human rights, and what do you do? What do you, when you think he's creating chemical weapons and you think yeah. he's got nukes, well, then. The, the effects of the media in the US were such that they believed that Saddam Hussein was responsible for Twin Towers, and yet it was quite clear that the people responsible for Twin Towers would be just as likely to have assassinated Hussein as they would have done to as they would have done to actually do the Twin Towers thing. Mm -hmm. That uh, was it. It was a naivety about the whole thing. I mean, the, the education of the Western population in global politics is is quite limited, I think, by the quality of the media. Such that I mean, I think you may have seen on how they got news for the last uh, just a few nights ago. Um, it was untrue, but yet plausible that two percent of Americans they said wanted to bomb. Ebola. 
Do you know what? That, <laughs> that is like... But it's, it's, not, it's not true, but it might be. <laughs> that reminds me of... Um, there's a guy called Mark Dice, an American journalist, and he, and he goes out into the streets of America and interviewing people and, like... Yeah. He asked some ridiculous questions, like, you know, yeah. would you like to bomb Ebola? What's your <laughs> thoughts on bombing Ebola? And he goes out and see the amount of the population that, just because they're on TV or they're, they're and being filmed moment. and because they've got a microphone mm-hmm. in front of them, they just kind of go with it. They don't know anything yeah. about it and they just go, oh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's right. I think we should be bombing Ebola. I think it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. I trust <laughs> Obama in bombing Ebola. I'm right behind him. In <laughs> fact, I'll sign, I'll sign that bill promoting the abominable and it's like crazy the subjects that he, that he goes out and asks people it's like you know to do with the constitution and would you like to repeal the constitution we are we are trying to repeal the constitution right now we know we don't think you have should have rights anymore just sign right here if you're for that oh yes i'm for that and it really is scary the amount of people that are just so blind to it and will just say anything when they've got a camera in front well, of you them can, you can see a, a distinct par- parallel with them I and mean, that, that's meant to be that's meant to be a joke, that idea of repealing the Constitution in the mm-hmm. US. But the, the, the European Convention on Human Rights, we've got UKIP and a significant part of the Conservative Party now campaigning to take, take away rights mm-hmm. that we have. And people voting for parties that want to take away rights okay. because they believe the story about, uh, about uh, you know, psychologically disturbed people having rights and therefore massacring you know, all their family or something That's what like that. Going on. Yeah, so there, there, there is the potential to persuade real populations. Um, to give throw away their rights. Well, that's uh, the scary thing just now is TTIP, um, where this transatlantic trade and investment oh, yes, partnership, yep. and yeah. and the rights of workers in Europe are really under threat. Yeah. Things like your national minimum wage, to to other things like uh, you know the GMOs in your food. Yeah. In America, they have different regulations. They have you know their chicken has these mad mm. chemicals in it that just wouldn't pass the EU regulations here. Yeah. But they will be under this transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Yeah. The only thing that exists in the world, um, you know, just now that's sort of similar is NAFTA, uh, the North American Free Trade Alliance yeah. um, between USA, Canada, and America. And is this the successor to GATT, the General <laughs> Agreement on Transfers and something like that, yeah. which was 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 aimed at uh, deregulation of employment regulations and so on. So it's like yeah. um, it seems to be a corporate power grab. Yeah. Um, where you're you're getting the, the corporations of America coming in, um, marrying with the EU, and and it's shocking. What what's at risk? You know, the Royal Mail, the NHS is in danger of being privatised, and and there's some interesting videos on YouTube. Um, if you if you just search TTIP and what is TTIP, and an interesting blog that we we always bang on about on the show, another angry voice. Um, he's got really interesting information. Um. A really cool viewpoint that certainly resonated with us anyway, and um, but TTIP on a on a basic level threatens all the rights that that, that Europe and and Britain we've we've worked hard unions have worked hard to 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 protect um, and like environmental rights for instance with us uh, in, in them Canada they have NAFTA um, and with NAFTA. Companies and corporations, if if they are at risk of losing revenue or or profit off of, say, like a fracking company comes into Dumbarton or Loch Lomond and TTIP is passed and the people of Dumbarton are opposed to fracking and we pass an environmental bill. If an environmental bill is passed and the fracking company have the rights, the licenses to frack in that land, then they are able to sue the state and the UK taxpayer for loss of earnings because they have the licences and that's what TTIP it kind of protects them and the thing is is it goes on in the court arbitration where it's like you know three unelected guys that could be paid off and it's really really scary and it's just the biggest corporate power grab but it's been all been done behind closed doors 90% of the people that have been uh, elected officials to represent us and talk to us are all industrial corporate representatives. It just seems, again, you, you don't hear any of this in the mainstream media. It's not been, not been fed to you, but again, scary, scary stuff. There's a mass unrepresentation of us on a massive scale at the minute, whether it's politics and it's corporations are just calling the shots. It's, it's definitely going to change, I think. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, um, it's it's on a 
attract a change. There has to be a point at which enough of the population can't take it anymore until it becomes untenable. Because, as, as uh, you know, I, I, this is my first mention of Karl Marx tonight. Um, my, the other biggest influence on me and, you know, my thinking, although Karl Marx you know, was writing in 1840s, so there's, it's easy to pick fault and to nitpick at some of the things Karl Marx said, but his insight into capitalism r- remains uh, true. And that, that said, it has internal contradictions. That the, the capitalists will try to increase profits, and they'll do that by, by reducing the cost of raw materials, reducing the cost of labour, and by increasing the cost of the items they sell. But when you reduce the, reduce the cost of labour so much that labour can't afford to buy the things you're manufacturing, then companies collapse. Unless, as has been cleverly done in, in, in the West in the last few years, you force the, the, you force the poorly paid labour to take out loans to start to live on the never-never. But even then, there's a point. There's a point at which it won't be sustainable and corporations will collapse because they've overreached. And that's, that's the, that will then be the opportunity, the democratic opportunity. It doesn't happen very often. It happened, it happened after World War II when we had a period of tremendous optimism after World War II, mm-hmm. partly because the officer class had served with the working men in, you know, in, in, in the war mm-hmm. and had a, for a short time, for a short time, the middle classes and the, the more affluent were empathetic towards the workers and they wanted the workers to have a better life because they served beside them and they respected them. And we had that, the, the 1945 government, the welfare state, the National Health Service, until about the mid-1970s, there's a study by the Economic Development Forum which says if you measure wealth properly, not just GDP, because obviously GDP doesn't mm-hmm. tell you what the ordinary person's earning, if you measure it more in a more complex way, the best year in history for the average working person was 1976, and it's been downhill since then. In 1976, you could keep a family on one wage. You went to university free, and you could, and you could got a grant. I was in I was at university in 1976. Mm-hmm. The the 70s are often portrayed as a very down, a very boring time, mm-hmm. or a very negative time, because of the industrial action. But if you look at it from the perspective of the ordinary person, industrial action was a sign of strength. It was mm-hmm. a sign that people could fight for their yeah, people their income, on. and it, and it worked because people were had had better wages then. Had better health had well not better than we have today in terms of healthcare because of the technological advances, but it, but it, the, the actual access was at a very high level, and uh, and that's that's been lost. It yeah. was a period of tremendous when it was the early part of my life, and uh, and it's a, it's a tremendous shame that that's been taken away. And the the BB, and the media coverage of trade unions has played a major part in that. And the BBC is guilty again, as are the other channels that they they portrayed they portrayed trade unionists as the enemy within. They swallowed Margaret Thatcher's view of things. Clearly the corporations are the enemies within, not the trade unions. Everything we have, everything we have, the fact that we have weekends, Mm -hmm. the fact that we have eight-hour days in some places, well, people are losing their eight-hour days, these are because of organised labour. And you meet so many people who've been, who've been, had their thinking distorted by media coverage of trade unions, by demonising trade union leaders as somehow bullying figures. And some of them were pretty tough guys, they had to be tough guys. But then, when someone says to me, I, I don't like unions, I say, so you don't like weekends, so you don't like your eight-hour day, mm-hmm. you don't like holidays, because none of these, none of these would be given. Exactly. Corporations wouldn't <coughs> give anything. And they're starting to seem stuck to away now. Well, exactly, that's the, the, the you've cyclist. you've got zero-hour contracts, you've got a minimum wage, yeah. it should be due to inflation, something like twelve and a half pounds an hour, yeah. in order to keep a family, if it was to rise at the same rate, the prices have, have yeah. risen, but now you're finding that minimum wage is £6.50 odd, and let no one can realistically keep themselves on yeah. that sort of wage. No. And and the gap between the normal people and the elites has just grown and grown and grown and grown until yeah. bang one day. All, all when all I was when I was at university, there was a theatre company that were very popular called Seven Eighty Four. I don't know if you've heard of them at all. No, no, no. Seven Eighty Four, but they were called Seven Eighty Four because seven percent of the population had eighty four percent of the wealth, and we thought that was shocking in the seventies. Seven eighty now, as you know, it's now one ninety nine, or it's yeah. less than one. Ninety-nine point something. It was seven eighty-four in the mid seventies, and and we were angry. We were angry. It was seven eighty-four. I just don't even know what you say about the situation. No. I mean, it's just getting it's worse so hard. and worse. How it's do terrible. You, I don't pers- like, personally. I don't know if without a war or without some major catastrophic event changing everybody, like changing. So that everybody wakes up tomorrow and their day is going to be different. Like they can't go and do what they're going to do. They can't go to work. Their, their whole lives are changed. I don't think. 
I, I think that it might need to come to that. It might need to come a massive scale event for everybody, yeah. for their pockets to be hit, for for whatever their, their family to be affected, for them to actually wake up and go, wait a minute. See, there's another yeah. war where not everything's completely blown up or aliens arrive. <laughs> aliens right. arrive. Right? I was going to suggest something a bit more plausible, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Still but, but it's late at night. Um, <laughs> I was going to suggest that, that what tends to lead to radical change is, is the politicisation of the middle classes. The, the, the workers are already aware of how damaged their situation is. Mm-hmm. It, it takes the middle classes because of their higher propensity to vote. Unfortunately, the workers don't vote enough. And, and that may the, what happened in Scotland is changing that, I think. There's no doubt about that. In that last election, obviously, the referendum was a massive turnout, so the working people did turn out there. But if, if conditions become... if The, the, the corporations and, and political elites depend on a reasonable-sized middle class to do their admin, to run the system. And if they impoverish them too much, that's when things start to become politicised and some people start to um, you know, withdraw their support. And my, my hope is, you, you talked about, I think you talked about what will happen, I think it's that uh, corporations, capitalism generally, has no self-writing mechanism. It heads towards crashes and it climbs out of crashes and mm-hmm. peaks and crashes again. And I think the opportunity will come when the corporations push too hard and insist on too much profit. They're already at that point, mm-hmm. but they'll keep on going until a significant number of the population is impoverished beyond what they can bear. Mm-hmm. And that's the point at which things will tip over. Paradigm shift will just Paradigm happen shift. there. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. That's brilliant. It's uh, great words. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's like, a great, great way to actually for the, sort of end the show, really. Well, I suggest a, re- a, a wee reading reference there for the audience. Absolutely. The, professor. Yeah, I do, yeah. the, the Paradigm Shift was, was developed by Thomas Kuhn. K-U-H-N. Well, well worth reading. Thomas Kuhn. So, <laughs> and I'll be asking about this uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I will be testing you on that. Yeah. Uh, I've not personally heard of that. I need to look into that. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of uh, so good chat to read into points, the yeah. tonight. There's been we, a lot of stuff to look up. Well, hi. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for me. coming on. Uh, for sure, our pleasure. The um, time's just absolutely flew by as usual. From nine till twelve, just. Did we get my song that? at the beginning? Is that was it played at the beginning? Uh, I've got one here just now, um, and then we've got time for maybe one more after that. So we're having the who. Is the this who, one right? Well, I'll yeah. have a look right now. Right? The, or the ooh, as they were known at the time. But ah, were they? Right? Right, cockney, yeah, cockney thing. The oh, ooh. What, what, the was ooh. The, what was the track? <laughs> um, won't get fooled again. It's the it's the obvious song after the referendum. Aye. Um, let's oh, hope aye. we won't get fooled again. Okay. That's you know, it has a great line in it. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. There you go, perfect, very apt. Um, so we'll get that on, but uh, John, we'll, we'll get you on after just these, uh, these these couple of tracks here, but thank you very much for coming on. Pleasure, thank the, you. The Twitter and the, the text have been building up so right. much, we've actually just not had a chance to right. read any of them out. I know, it's been uh, constant, but normally... Uh, Will you reply to them? I have been doing it a bit like here and there, yeah. but there's, there's a vast amount that we'll try and get through as well, so we'll get this yeah. track on. Listen, if you, want, if you want it forward in to me, you know... No, definitely. I'll, but, um, you know, even not even quite a lot. If you you know, I don't mind responding if people. And I'll copy you back in, obviously. Definitely no bother. Because nice really interactivity is a great thing for a show, isn't it? Aye, and, really? and that's exa- we've had a lot of that tonight, which is yeah. which has been brilliant. And so, I'm really, I'm really keen that that you know anywhere. I mean, I, I, my daughter says I'm old fashioned, but on on Facebook, if people communicate with me, I absolutely respond. I think you know, no way, I'm just a bit something not to. But she says, oh no, you can ignore this and you can ignore that because she <laughs> must get lots of trivial stuff, but. The yeah. stuff I get, I think you've got to show respect for that person taking the time to for express sure an interest. Yeah. Right, OK, we're going to get this track on. It's actually playing, you two don't have headphones in, so we've cut over the top of it. It's Virus Scott's here on Pulse 90.4. Hope you've enjoyed the show tonight. So much activity on Twitter and Facebook and the text. It's very hard to get through, but we will. So keep your eyes on Virus Scott's on Facebook and on the Twitter. And, of course, uh, keep tuned to Pulse 98.4 for the, the rest of the evening. Well, morning, I should say, but until then, catch us again next week. And from us and John Robertson, it's a goodbye for tonight.